morning, everyone. Welcome to the Board of Behavioral Sciences, the Telehealth Committee meeting. Today is um, June 25th, 2021, and the time now is 9 o'clock. And this meeting is held uh, on the WebEx platform in pursuant to the governor's executive order and 2520. So, um, at this time, I would like to have uh, Christina um, to help us establish a quorum. Good morning. Christina Wong? Here. Susan Friedman? Here. Christopher Jones? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you so Thank you. much. So um, we, I would like to uh, proceed to have uh, the staff and uh, the board members to introduce themselves. So when I call your name, would you please uh, um, say your name and your um, your your um, position? So I'm uh, Christina Wong. I'm the LCS deputy member. So the next one would be Susan. I'm Susan Friedman, and I am a public member, and I'm very very interested in telehealth because I realize. Since the pandemic, this is the future. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan and Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Jones. I'm the uh, the LEP member. Thank you. Um, let's see. Let's move to our staff, Steve. I swear, after all these times of being on Zoom, still don't learn that. Steve Sodergren, Board of Behavioral Sciences. I'm the executive officer. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we have uh, Roseanne. Hi, I'm Roseanne Helms. I'm the legislative manager for the board. Uh, Sabina. Good morning, Sabina Knight, legal counsel for the board. And uh, Christina also. Hello, I'm Christina Kitamura. I'm the administrative analyst for the board. Thank you very much. Um, and then we will have uh, our next agenda item, which is the consent calendar. So, and that is the discussion and possible approval of March 26, 2021 committee uh, meeting minutes. So, um, let's open up for, you know, discussion and um, any, any discussion and from the board member. Okay, I'm seeing none. And let's see. Oh, I forgot to have our moderator to explain the Q&A function. But let's open up for the, uh, you know, for the um, public, you know, finish this item. And then <laughs> moderator, would you please explain it afterwards? Christina, can we have a motion and a second first and then go to public comment and then come back for our vote? Absolutely. We certainly can do that. We can make it faster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sabina. Okay. Any so no question. So I will need a motion. I'll um, I'll move. You know to approve the March 26, 2021 committee minute meeting minutes. I'll second. Uh, and Susan second. Very good. So um, I will um, moderator. Would you please open the um, the panel? Yeah. This is the moderator, and if you'd like, I will just provide all the instructions right now. Yes. <laughs> so for today's public comment, we will be utilizing two features. We'll be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. And if you'd like to utilize that, you'll be looking for the Q&A icon on your screen. It's a question mark inside of a square. When you click on that, it will pop open a text box. And in that text box, you can type, I would like to make a comment or simply just comment and then submit that to the panelists. Our other option today is to utilize our hand raise feature. And if you have our participant list open at the very bottom, you will see a small icon of a hand. If you click on that, that will raise your hand. I would just kindly ask that when you're done with your comment, if you would lower your hand after that so that we do not think you are wanting to speak again. We will be taking comments in the order that they are received. Each commenter will have three minutes to make their comment. I will be providing a 15 second reminder when your time is about to expire. And when it does expire, I will mute your microphone and move on to the next commenter. I would just ask that you be patient if sometimes we get multiple requests for comment and it takes us a little bit to work through them. So if you've submitted one request, please do not submit a second one until we've gotten to you. 
And with that, our first comment comes from Sarah Jayosi. Sarah, your line is open and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm here um, to um, express concern regarding the uh, telehealth waiver expiring expiring June 30th. I actually sit on several boards. One of them is the Ambulatory Association for Behavioral so, Health. Sarah, this is the moderator, if I may. Uh, the comments we're taking right now are on the meeting minutes that were being approved. Is oh, that what this is regarding? My apologies. This is my first time attending. No, I don't have comments for that. Okay, not a problem. So if you could wait until either one, they get to an agenda item that addresses that or they will have an agenda item that allows public comment for any items that are not on today's agenda, and then um, resubmit your request at that time. Thank you. You're welcome. And with that, there's no other request for comment. Christina, you're muted. Yes, I'm like Steve, you know, <laughs> so I'm, my apology. Um, so let's uh, move forward to have a vote. And so Christina, please. And here's the, here's the roll call. Susan Friedman. Hi. Christopher Jones. Yes. Christina Wong. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, so our next agenda item is the overview and discussion of wait the overview of the committee's role and task, and I believe is Roseanne. Yes, thank so, you so much. Thank you. So the telehealth committee has been meeting for for about six months now. It held its first meeting on January twenty second, of the beginning of this year, and the purpose of the committee is to work through several issues. Um, regarding telehealth and to determine if the board's statutes and regulations related to the practice of telehealth need to be updated or clarified. So, so far we've discussed our future topic areas, the existing statutes and regulations related to telehealth. Um, proposed changes agreed to so far are shown in attachment B. Um, we've looked at some laws of the other states that pertain to temporary practice across state lines. And while we're not discussing that further today, we'll be picking that up at a future meeting, um, potentially clarification of laws, telehealth laws for associates and trainees. This is going to be continued today. And then, of course, supervision via video conferencing. And that discussion will be continued today. So I've included um, a couple of attachments. Like I mentioned, attachment B is what the telehealth regulations, not the law, the statutes, but regulations we've discussed so far and agreed to change. Or pursue a change to and then also issues that's kind of our attachment a is kind of our to do list um, as you can see it's quite lengthy and it's going to take some time to get through but um, several issues related to telehealth need to be discussed and so those are detailed in attachment a and so as this committee progresses we will make our way through that list so this item is just kind of an update so i will open it up um, back to christina Thank you so much. So any discussion for the um, our roles and tasks? So it looks like, you know, we have really made, you know, good progress. Yeah. And so thank you so much, Roseanne. And so I want to open up to um, to the public and see if there's any comments. Oh, OK. So I think this is this is good. Um, I think, you know, I, I think I will close the, the public comments for this time, you know, just because I think this is only an update and overview. So let's move to the next agenda item. Um, let's talk about, you know, the overview and discussion of other states telehealth allowance. Hey, so and again, yeah, I thanks. thought it would be a good idea to start out the meeting. We're going to be discussing a lot of technical issues related to telehealth and supervision today. So I thought it would be good to just kind of provide some background um, of more extensive information of, of what other states do. So this is meant to be just more informative. Um, the Association of Social Work Boards was, was nice enough to provide um, our board with two spreadsheets that, that kind of tracks various requirements and waivers related to telehealth and supervision via video conferencing. 
Um, and so I'll discuss a couple of particular of other states um, in some of the materials later today, but I just kind of wanted to put this piece of information out there as a reference point. Um, so out, attachment A here outlines waivers and allowances other social work licensing boards adopted due to the COVID-19 state of emergency. I just thought that was kind of interesting, so I included it. Um, a lot of those are in the process of winding down now, as are ours. And then attachment B provides information about other social work boards licensing laws related to clinical supervised experience and clinical supervised experience and electronic practice. Um, and so that's there. I will just as a caveat to that, I know that a lot of other states are kind of um, looking at the same things that we're looking at right now. Telehealth has really um, you know, exploded during COVID. I think Steve will attest to this as well, that um, a, a lot of licensing boards are are, are trying to, to figure out what law changes are needed. So we're probably in the next couple of years as things get moved through various legislatures and get adopted, we're probably going to be seeing other states having a lot of changes as well. That's that's all for this item. It's mostly just intended to be a reference for people to look at if they'd like. Thanks, Roseanne. Since this is said that is a discussion. So, you know, so I just want to come back to the to the board members to see if there's any questions about um, you know, the attachment. So very, very thorough and also provide a wonderful overview for what the other states practices has been since COVID. So, you know, so this is such a wonderful document, you know, for us to base on, you know, to, um, you know, when the, the, you know, the other discussion items are going to be addressed. So that's my little comment. So thank you, Roseanne. So board members, Chris or Susan, any comments? Well, my only comment is while I think it's really important to learn if there's some great things that other states are doing that we should consider, I, I, I really want to make sure that we have contacted or that we're in contact with all the organizations, and Steve will know this, whether any of the organizations have done their own uh, survey of their members about their their experience of using telehealth during the pandemic and whether they found it was better for their clients, if their clients found it more useful for them because they didn't have to spend time parking and getting transportation and whether their clients responded in a way to them that makes them feel that this is an equal kind of work that they're doing together. Anyway, the bottom line is I just think that we need to find out from all the different organizations and the licensees whether or not this has worked for them in their practice. I mean, I think it's an important question we need to know the answer to. Thank you, Susan. You know, this is always nice to, you know, to learn about, you know, to see what, what's going on, you know, outside California. So your passion is shared. So, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, just to kind of uh, talk about that a little bit. Um, I've been in discussions and I'm in, currently in discussions with uh, some of the organizations, national organizations, where we're trying to look at telehealth and having conversations about where we want to go. Um, no, none of them have really done a, a survey of clients per se. Of, you know, how has the outcome been for you, or what was the, you know, have you experienced a, a better, you know, better therapy from that, or are there any problems? As regulators, what we've been really talking about, though, is has there any, been any complaints regarding telehealth? And that, because as a regulator, that's kind of what we need to focus on is the, is the consumer protection. Um, not to say that I think it is, it is a valid point that we should kind of reach out there to see is this telehealth, is it actually giving positive results? And I know there are other organizations in California we can rely on that for information on that. Um, but I know nationally, um, when that question is brought up is, has there been any complaints or any, you know, um, any enforcement actions that you've seen because of telehealth? And usually the answer is it's rare, very rare uh, that there's a, been a complaint because of a because of that modality. So just to kind of little input on that, but we will keep looking. 
I think <clears throat> as we keep doing more research and, and getting more articles and such about the outcomes of, you know, for the client themselves, I think that'll be important. We can bring that up. So if we get some more information on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, and just that, Susan, I know we had discussions about, uh, we will be talking about um, the surveys later on. And I think that that is an option. Um, we do have some questions in there. And I think part of that, um, it's not necessarily geared towards the consumer, but we will, I think we want to add in some questions in there regarding, you know, what the, either the licensee or the associate, how do they feel the outcomes are, or have they expect, had good experience with the telehealth format, so. Susan? Um, I just want to say that I, I do hope that we do something that's focused on the people that we serve in California as opposed to nationally, because what's happening here is most important. And when Steve mentioned the articles, I mean, I have spread on my desk here all the articles that I saw, which is probably just a minuscule amount of what's been out there. But one of them, which I found really amazing, the title is Navigating the Current Therapist Shortage. And I think that's an, that is another issue that sometime we have to deal with. Thank you so much, Susan. Roseanne? Yeah, I, um, I will just say we are um, planning a survey um, to various groups within the state. And actually, the way that, we, uh, that we're planning to end the meeting today after, because um, we've, we've started with some, some draft survey questions, and then we'll end the meeting after we've had all this discussion. It's likely, my thought is it's likely to, to possibly raise other questions that we'd like to ask. So at the end of the day, we're going to take a look at the survey questions um, and see if, after, you know, based on our conversation today and in the past, if there's any other questions we'd like to capture before we send that survey out. We know the staff are very proactive about this. And so, and that's also part of the discussion we talked about, you know, at the beginning of our telehealth committee too. So this is actually all good. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Chris, you know, do you have any comments? Is I did really like the perspective of seeing what other states are doing. Um, and to Susan's point, you know, California is a unique animal in itself. Um, just with regards to, you know, the size of our state, the variety of, of cultures and, um, you know, the, the different needs that we have. But it was, it was good to see how proactive other places are. And I think that, um, you know, when we're talking about regulation, that it's always good to have a model about what's happening outside so that we can, you know, we can craft something that's going to be relevant, uh, you know, to our own consumer protection. So thank you, Roseanne, for putting that together. It was really, it was really a very, very interesting read. So thank you. I, I actually can't take credit. Um, all the thanks goes to the Association of Social Work Boards. So um, they did a great job with, with that document and I'm very thankful that they were willing to share it. Yep, thank you so much. So, um, so Sabina, I think this one is, you know, we can open up for the public to make comments, right? Even though there's no discussion item, I mean, no action items that we need. Absolutely. Okay, so moderator, would you please open the, uh, the, um, the public comment section? Yes, this is the moderator. I've opened the Q&A panel. Again, if you'd like to utilize that as your means for requesting comment, please click on the Q&A icon on your screen, type comment, or I would like to make a comment into the text field, or you can also utilize that raised hand feature by locating the small hand icon on your screen and pressing that. And I'm not seeing any requests for comment at this time. Oh, hold on. We have one that just popped in. Uh, Jen Allen. And Jen, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Hi. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is Jennifer Alley with CAMP. I think this discussion is just 
you know, starting at the right note with a lot of questions. Um, the, the documents that Roseanne was able to obtain are just so helpful and have so much information. And I think that they're gonna be a great resource for all of us as we move through and try to navigate how we wanna move forward with telehealth in California. So just really just a thank you and, and a good morning to everyone. That is all. And good morning to you, Jennifer. You know, you're, you know, you always have, you know, really good comments. So now, thank you very much. Looks yeah. like there's another one. Yes. Yes. Uh, Sarah Giosi. And yeah. your line is open. Thank you. My apologies. I did not know when to speak or not. Um, but I just wanted to communicate that I'm speaking on behalf of the Ambulatory Association for Behavioral Health and the Ambulatory Association for Behavioral Health um, California, Southern California group, as well as the um, California Society for Clinical Social Work that we want to advocate for um, the continued use of telehealth, where uh, we will uh, be able to provide more services to individuals in rural areas, individuals that don't have technology, the technology or the um, ability um, to utilize um, um, different platforms. Um, sometimes in hospital programs, we serve individuals with psychosis and they do not, um, and um, they have difficulties with trans transportation or access or even ability to get devices. I am aware that in California, we have Assembly Bill 32 on telehealth that's amended in the Assembly, which um, states that uh, telehealth has been proven to be an important modality for patients to stay connected, and it's critical for California Medi-Cal patients. The bill also recognizes the practice of telehealth as a legitimate means uh, by which individuals can receive health care. There are journal articles published out there that demonstrate the efficacy of telehealth. So I just wanna um, wrap up by stating that I wanna advocate for um, the waiver to be extended indefinitely to continue utilizing this very important modality, um, as well as allowing hospitals who continue to um, social distance. We actually are not open, even though California is open hospitals are mandated to continue social distancing. So most hospital programs, inpatient and outpatient, continue to provide telehealth services because we continue to be mandated to do so. So it's critical that this waiver be extended. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and Sarah, and if, I could please, yes. if I could please ask Sarah if you could lower your hand back down. And our next comment comes from Deborah Sharon. Deborah, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, I operate a small nonprofit counseling center in Los Angeles area. And some I we very much enjoy doing telehealth and our clients and uh, everyone seems to like it as well. My question or concern in the future is the logistics of it. We have a relatively small waiting room, small consultation rooms. Uh, so I would be concerned about uh, social distance between everybody um, and we are under lease as well. So we wouldn't be able to make any dramatic changes. So I, I would love the telehealth to be continued. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think the next one is Ben, right? It is Ben Caldwell. Your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Um, so thank you, Ben Caldwell, licensed MFT, and just wanted to express my appreciation to the committee and staff for um, the the systematic way in which you are approaching the topic. You know, certainly, there are a lot of lessons to be taken from the past year plus, and uh, at least uh, early indications seem to be that the improvements in access that have been facilitated by telehealth. Um, have come without meaningful added risk to the public. Um, and that's a really important lesson, I think, to take in terms of policy going forward. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. 
uh, moderator. I think we have another one. We do. Let's see, Heather Jans. Heather, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Walker Jans. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in Fresno, California. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of amendments for supervision. Uh, I've met with several other uh, private practice therapists in our area, and we're concerned about being able to support our employees and protect them uh, throughout the rest of this pandemic. Uh, we all know the Delta variant is coming up. Um, I specifically have employees with small children, and we don't want to be um, carriers to, you know, um, harming any of our families or anything. So I'd like to ask that um, you please consider extending the waiver for doing supervision via video conferencing. Um, the other thing is that I want you guys to know that all of us agree that doing supervision via video has improved the quality of our supervision. We're able to share a lot more, be very interactive um, with the supervision materials and education. Um, so please consider that as um, you make these decisions. There's a lot of us that um, all agree. We've also met with assembly member Rambula and expressed our concerns. And I thank you for allowing us to make comment. Thank you very, very much. Uh, so moderator, anybody else? Looks like that's it for now. Very good. So, um. I think that's um, that's a really good set of comments. And so again, you know, for this particular agenda item, we don't really need to um, do any take any action. So um, for this time, then I would like to move. Oh, Chris, go ahead. Am I allowed to ask a, a follow up question when um, we have public comment or no? Yes. Can can I ask a question of the of the person that just sat and just commented? Yeah. Can I? really quick Chris um, yeah. some of those comments were kind of coming out of order and actually we were allowing them so if it's about the extension of our waiver if we could wait for the discussion when we actually have that agenda item up coming up next I believe sure. um, if, if that's okay I'm sorry not to just trying to keep it in order yeah no no that's fine okay Great. thank you I appreciate it Yes, yeah, and that is a very important thing for, you know, board members, you know, to to know that, you know, sometimes, you know, we are talking about, you know, gathering, you know, information about, you know, the uh, the discussion, you know, of the uh, information that, um, you know, Roseanne shared, which is the other state health telehealth allowances, you know, and any of the other things that is not pertain to this particular uh, discussion item, so we cannot respond. So also, this is a good education for, for the public to know, not that we're ignoring your comments. It's just the law, you know, you know, you know, governance that what we can discuss and what we cannot. But, you know, but I'm sure that, you know, like I say, you know, your your point, you know, your opinions are very important to us. And so, you know, don't ever think that we just listen and ignore. No, we don't, but we just cannot respond. So being said, I think we, you know, any other discussion from the board members, any other feedback staff? So, you know, so Sabina, I think I did a good job explaining, right? <laughs> okay, good. All righty. So in that sense, let's move to our next agenda item. And, uh, and that will be the discussion of the telehealth uh, coursework requirement, potential telehealth coursework requirement. And Roseanne, take it away. Right, so one of the things is, as we've gone through a couple of meetings of the telehealth committee now that we've kind of heard as a recurring theme is that if we're going to consider, you know, opening up more allowances of telehealth and supervision via video conferencing that it also be discussed along with it, but the potential for adding a telehealth coursework requirement or potentially a supervision via video conferencing coursework into required curriculum so that we can ensure that our practitioners and our supervisees really understand, have an understanding of how to safely practice telehealth and do supervision via video conferencing. 
So I wanted to bring that up here before we um, kind of got started on the on the um, law amendments that we're going to be discussing in the next two items after this. Um, the topic of providing telehealth services to clients could be added to the degree program requirements if, if the committee or the board desired for new applicants moving forward. However, for existing associates and licensees, if we wanted to capture them in that, um, they're already finished with school, so that would likely need to be uh, accomplished with continuing education. For supervisees, um, that's a little bit um, more of a complex question for supervisors. I, sorry, I misspoke. For supervisors, coursework um, regarding supervision via video conference, if that was to be required, it would could be required as part of the one time. So we're we're in the process of running supervision regulations right now. Um, and that we're hoping that will be a come effective January 1st of this coming year. Um, so if we were to require um, coursework su about supervision via video conferencing, that would probably need to be a regulation change. It would need to either be part of there's there's going to be a one time 15 hour supervision course. And then there's something called continuing professional development um, that supervisors would need to do that's um, various activities or coursework, and it's a six hour biannual um, requirement. So every other year. So that's kind of the the um, what would need to be done and and where things could be placed. Um, there is precedent in in law for this. So we have a lot of different topics that are required in law um, for for our practitioners to cover. Um, some of them are a condition of licensure. Others are one time requirements that have been added over time and must be completed as continuing education. So. For example, we have um, required coursework and spousal partner uh, abuse assessment detection and intervention. Uh, our licensees are required to complete coursework in human sexuality, child abuse assessment and reporting, uh, aging and long term care, and alcoholism and other substance dependency. And so these requirements, some of them just say you need to complete coursework in this topic. Some of the requirements, if you if you look at the law a little deeper, um, it will actually say what the coursework physically has to cover. There'll be like a list of these are the topics it needs to cover. So there's varying degrees of, of how specific we can get on that. Um, probably the two most recent examples are the um, the seven hours of coursework at our assessment and treatment of HIV and AIDS as a one time requirement that was put in place <clears throat> probably about eight or nine years ago now. And um, individuals that did not have could not show proof of completing such a class would need to do needed to do that as a CE course. And then most recently, we just had this year a, a requirement come into effect. This is probably the most comprehensive one. Um, this was a requirement for all applicants and licensees to have a minimum of six hours of coursework or applied experience under supervision in suicide risk assessment and intervention. So for um, for new applicants, that that had to be um, as of January 1st of this coming year, that had to be shown uh, um, in their as part of their application. For existing licensees, as of January 1st, as they renew after that date, they need to certify that they've either taken coursework in that topic or have experience in that topic. So. Um, those are kind of some recent examples, and I've included um, the more recent ones in attachments if you wanted to look at the actual licensing law for those. So I think that the committee would probably want to discuss a couple of questions. If the board to re were to require telehealth training, what topics should it specify be covered, if any, or should it just be a general requirement in tra training and treating clients via telehealth? And then where should the coursework be located? Do we want it for new students moving forward? Do we want it for everybody? Um, do we want coursework for just um, all practitioners or do we want special coursework for supervisors? How exactly would, what's the desire to have? How, how would you like that to look if we were to do this? So with that, I will open it up for discussion. So thank you so much, Roseanne. So I, I'm, I'm glad I'm seeing hands. So go ahead, Chris, and then Susan. Well, I, I agree. I think that that we definitely, well, I think we should seriously consider adding coursework on to, um, you know, the the CE units at least with regards to current supervisors. In my opinion, we're at the infancy stages 
of this new telehealth supervision, um, you know, experience. And, we, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And I think there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of, um, you know, kind of, you know, learning by error. And if there's a way to minimize that um, to, you know, to both make sure, making sure that we properly supervise and train our, our associates, um, you know, with the, with the thought that that is going to improve consumer protection, I think it's important, um, you know, because this is new for everybody. And there's not a ton of research out there on the overall effectiveness of, of, you know, the, the, um, the telehealth versus in-person um, supervision, what that looks like down the line as far as quality of training for people. Um, so I think that, you know, because we're so new at this, that we need to, to be careful. And, and I, I, I tend to err on the side of caution. So the more training I think that we can get, the better um, that we're going to be at it. Because to Susan's point, this isn't going to go away. Um, and as we've heard from many of our um, of our consumers um, and the public that, you know, they're, they, they want to continue with, um, with telehealth. So I think in this, this point, um, uh, coursework is going to be important. Okay. Thanks, Curtis. And Susan. Well, I agree with everything. Um, can you hear me? Am I yes. Yes. Um, I agree with everything that Chris has said. We don't know. We don't know. But I definitely am in favor of the supervision happening with that 15, was it a 15 hour course, Roseanne? Wait, I can't hear you. So it's, it's a one time 15 hour course. Uh, okay. I, 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 okay. I knew I had 15. I think we, I am definitely in favor of that because that's part of the coursework and this should be part of the coursework and I am not in favor of doing it every other year. That's, that would be ridiculous. Thank you. So my, my comment is that, you know, two sides, you know, so one, you know, I think we always are very cautious about adding, um, you know, CEUs, you know, for the licensees, you know, because the, um, the more that you know there are a lot of the emerging issues and sometimes you know we um feel like that you know some of them you know that's uh, definitely warren you know that's um you know the push but some you know but we we also have to be very careful you know it's about like you know the balance you know of the yeah the ceus you know because of you know all these requirements and before you know it you know then you know not not only about the cost but also it's really about like you know what what is you know what really is the point and it becomes a pretty heavy burden you know on the uh, you know on the license on the uh, registrants and also for the supervisors so now being said being said it doesn't mean that i am against it <laughs> I think the point is that, you know, I think we have to, you know, think about like, you know, whether it becomes like a ongoing thing, you know, ongoing requirement or whether it's a one time requirement. And so, you know, so I, I think that's that's just something for for us to consider, you know, and I would actually love to hear more from the, uh, the educational institution, you know, and also see like, you know, especially, you know, for the incoming registrants. I think, you know, incoming, you know, uh, students, you know, what, what has been, you know, the component of telehealth and then we can take care of, you know, the one that is like right now in between, you know, and then, the, you know, and the big part, actually, my biggest concern, you know, are the supervisors, because those are the one who's out of school, you know, that may not have any, you know, of the, um, you know, practice, exp you know, the, the telehealth, some practice experience, but not like Chris say, you know, there's just not that a ton of you know, guidance and, you know, literature, you know, about like how you do, you know, the, the efficiency and the efficacy, you know, of the uh, tele video conferencing supervision. So that's just my two cents. And Chris, you want to supplement? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, um, I, you know, Christina, to your point, you know, we, we can only have so many hours of requirements before it just becomes, you know, uh, too daunting. Um, I really think that, that this, the, um, the telehealth supervision can be woven into the 15 hours of 
um, of requirement that we're going to that we're going to make. I think that the, it's a reasonable expectation to um, you know to insert that. Um, I also you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that it's that that's also something that we would need to do as recurring CEUs for, um, you know, like we do with law and ethics. Like, I don't know that that's something that would need to happen every renewal period for for current supervisors once they've done that that 15 hours. But I do think that it would be a great option to have for, um, you know, for uh, just continuing it in general if we're looking at. at at um, you know, kind of beefing up our skills as as new research comes out and as new um, you know new ways of of uh, doing this happen. So, but yeah, thanks, Chris. Actually, you know, I want to respond to that too. I think that initial fifteen hours, you know, it's a really wonderful thing, and also the law is you know we're introducing legislative package, you know, to change the supervision the supervisor training requirement. So if all all rules and regulation passed, right, you know, then we will be also requiring the supervisor, all supervisor to take a six units of the supervision classes for every renewal period. And so I think that's the, um, you know, that's really important to, to remember that it is an ongoing challenges. So, you know, at the same time, I also feel like that, you know, there is just so much embrace, you know, so telehealth is really a, a method of delivery. You know, and it you know it encompasses you know the the understanding of the um, the implementation of our mandate, you know our you know our mandate to like you know reporting and stuff like that. You know the you know the the kind of like the basic interview skill to you know to, you know just different you know issues. And so I think that's um you know I would actually you know be more open to you know have that content, you know, the telehealth content, you know, to, um, you know, to infuse or diffuse in the, um, you know, in the, um, you know, kind of like the requirement. I, I think we, we might have it right. You know, what the, uh, the classes, you know, supposed to entail. And so, you know, so that's kind of my thought, you know, for the supervisor wise and um, Roseanne and then Susan, I'll come back to you. <laughs> Want to follow up this topic and I'll come back to yours. So go ahead, Susan uh, uh, and Roseanne. One point yes. I wanted to make with the 15 hour course, so supervisors, new supervisors are required to take a one time 15 hour course, but then they don't have to take it again. So the only way to capture existing supervisors would be to in that six hour every other year requirement. Um, so we just need to be careful about that. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to be ongoing. You know, it could still be a one time requirement, but the only way to capture those people that are already are ready to have already taken their 15 hour course is to to require it as part of the renewal, the six hour course. Yeah, so it's really about the tracking, you know, and also, you know, how do you actually, you know, be able to audit, you know, things like that. Well, that's all that is another another issue. So um Yes. Roseanne. Also, keep in mind that the um, the fifteen hour and the six hour those are regulation changes, not statute changes. So it usually takes a little bit longer to do a regulation change than a law change. Yes, that is a very good reminder. <laughs> and I think you know maybe Roseanne, you can give us like kind of a historically, you know, just recently, you know, the time frame for how many years, you know, that might take, you know, for the regulations to change. For the for a regulation, um, typically once it's approved, but written and approved by the board, which can take, you know, three to six months, depending on how much how much back and forth there is about the about the language. Um, once we get um, regulations actually turned in for initial review, it can take a, a year to two years to get regulations approved. Yeah, it does take a while. Yes, um, Susan. Um, I had a question. Um, I'm curious whether we have heard from a lot of our licensees during this whole period asking questions about telehealth, com confused about what they're allowed to do, not allowed to do, what they found. I mean, I'm just curious, Steve, you probably are the best one to, to answer that. I mean, I don't know how they would communicate. And the other thing I really do want to know is who okays these things that take a year or two? Um, 
for the you know the questions that we've been receiving from licensees yeah really it hasn't been to what am i supposed to do when i'm using this platform what am i supposed to do you know using a telehealth it, it's been more can i perform telehealth in california if i'm licensed from out of state or if i'm in state can i do telehealth to a client out of state and that's really been the concerns um, for actually how to operate that I think there are pretty there are pretty um, well defined kind of uh, guidelines out there as a and I, I hate to be ignorant here, but with uh, the standards that are supposed to be used in these uh, in these formats and such. So the question about how you know what what we need to do when we do telehealth hasn't really come up to us because I think agencies and and agencies really define that. So. Um, that question hasn't come up. And then who approves the right? Are you talking about the regulations? Yes. That goes through. Roseanne, do you want to talk to that kind of the process? Yeah, the regulations have a, have a um, pretty detailed process. They go to the department. They have to clear the, um, the agency that um, oversees DCA. They have to go to the Department of Finance and also OAL. Um, so it's, it's a pretty lengthy process to do a regulation. So, you know, so it means that, oh, it means that, you know, the, uh, the timing, you know, how we pursue, you know, the, the regulation change, you know, that, you know, it really, you know, need to, you know, take into consideration, you know, because of the fact that, you know, in, you know, that this is right now, it's a very, you know, hot topic. And I think the need to protect the, the consumers, you know, are very, you know, eminent. And so, um, so take that into consideration. That's for sure. Is there a way around it? Is there a way around that? I mean, another way of doing it? Is, would it be quicker to get someone to offer legislation? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. No, it would have to be that requirement is in regulations. So there, it would have to be a regulation change. Yes. So, yes, you know, so it's so important that we have the, you know, the you know, basically the guidance, you know, right now, you know, it's, you know, it's, we're operating under the executive um, order. And so once it's expired, you know, unless it's being renewed, you know, otherwise the things will go back, you know, to, to where we, it was. So I think that, um, you know, it may be, you know, a little bit more technical, but at the same time, I think it, it's very important also for us to consider which pathway that, you know, we should be, you know, we should pursue. So, um, you know, let's share, you know, I would love to hear from the public, you know, I think this is, um, you know, this is, you know, a, a very important thing about like, you know, what we do, you know, with the telehealth training. So, um, I would, let's see, you know, so the uh, moderator, would you please open up the Q&A and it looks like there's a hand raised already. <laughs> This is the moderator. I have reopened the Q&A panel. So again, if you'd like to utilize that function, you can locate that Q&A icon on your screen and click on it and type comment into the text field. And as well, the raised hand feature is activated. Our first comment is going to come from Jen Alley. Jen, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Thank you, moderator. This is Jennifer Alley with Camped, and I found the little hand icon at the top of the q a box i'm very excited because i thought i was gonna have to type all day um but anyway that's just my technical issues but again you know camp is just really happy to have the telehealth uh, committee you know having a thoughtful discussion um you know on training and honestly you know we think that the survey um that's you know later on the agenda really needs to be completed and analyzed to get the feedback the critical feedback from everybody who utilized telehealth from the schools the supervisors um, and providers and and we'll be very happy to um, promote the survey through all of our you know avenues our newsletter facebook and whatnot um, and i'll honestly be you know referring to the need to have the survey data completed you know before we make any significant changes and start the long process of of you know making uh, regulatory changes um you know obviously we do think training should be added to the the coursework um for trainees in schools um 
uh, telehealth supervision could be added to the supervision course, but we do hesitate to mandate a, a new CE for our, our existing licensees because, you know, CEs are, you know, continuing education is, you know, our members have the opportunity to, to, to select what areas they think they need um, to gain ex additional education um, in. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, how should telehealth training be implemented could be possibly, you know, added to the survey um, it, to get feedback and, and see what, you know, the actual, uh, you know, clinicians and, and schools and supervisors think. Um, you know, again, similar to the questions that Steve said, you know, our members' questions have been, can we do telehealth? Not necessarily, how do we do it? Um, and so I think that the survey will provide a lot of answers for that. So thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, so yeah, I think the survey certainly, you know, certainly will provide a lot of the um, information, you know, needed information, and you know, and for us to, um, you know, to give us that that um, direction, you know, what the uh, opinions of the public, and then we can actually, you know, as a reference, you know, to make the good uh, recommendation, you know, for you know for the legislative change. So thank you. So I think there's another uh, public comments, right? We do. Our next one comes from Tara and Jen, if I can please ask you to lower your hand. Tara, your line is open and you will have three minutes. Hi, my name is Tara and I'm just coming from a student perspective. I'm currently in my second year of getting my master's in MFT and doing my internship. And most of my internship has been done through telehealth. Um, and I want to say that um, Alliant University, where I go, they sent us an email offering us a free um, telehealth course through PESI, which I took, which was really helpful going to internship and starting off using telehealth. So I definitely want to recommend adding that to the coursework. And then as far as the supervision goes, um, it's been really easy having supervision on um, telehealth because we can easily share our videos for critique and comments rather than being in a group in person format. Um, it's just been really easy being able to get supervision through telehealth. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, this is good that to hear from the student perspective. Uh, moderator, next one, please. And Tara, if I could remind you to lower your hand, please. And our next comment comes from Heather Jans. Heather, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Hi, thank you for allowing me to comment again. I wanted to share my experiences. Um, I, I've worked within telehealth since before the pandemic, sitting in different psychiatry appointments with clients and then uh, as a staff therapist at Lyra, I sat in a licensed group for therapists doing solely telehealth. And then now I'm a supervisor for therapists who do telehealth. And I will say that I think therapists have a lot of questions about how to conduct telehealth, what should happen in a crisis, um, what the format should be like when you first start the therapy session, what happens when the connection is lost. And um, maybe they're just not wanting to contact the board or camped about questions like that but it's so important and i'm really grateful that we weren't flying blind and we had um i know ben caldwell put out uh, a training um, specifically for california and i required all my therapists that i hired to take that so that we had a basic understanding of what should happen especially in a crisis um, so I would say this is extremely important to have in um, curriculum as these trainees are going through their programs. Um, as I'm starting to interview trainees for positions, the ones that have done telehealth this past year have a lot better understanding and uh, knowledge about how to conduct a proper telehealth uh, session and provide good consumer care. So I do trust the universities to provide that. And I have seen um, that it, you know, these trainees coming out are more prepared, but I think it's really important that somewhere people are getting this information to protect the consumers. Thank you so much, Heather. 
That's still cool. very, very helpful also. Um, let's see, moderator, is there anybody else? We do, we have one more from Sarah. Sarah, your line is open, you'll have three minutes. I'm sorry, I did not raise my hand, I just made a comment. I know. Um, so for board meetings, the comments have to be read into the record for the recording oh, for the minutes. Okay. So if we could just ask you to state your comment out loud, please. Sure. Um, I just wanted to state as an educator in an MSW program, we have um, modified curriculum to include um, telehealth. Um, so within the MSW curriculum, we added a lot of information related to ethical legal issues management of high risk issues such as suicidality it, it, when using a telehealth um, platform. So schools um, in general, my understanding from discussing this with colleagues have made modifications within the curriculum to adapt to the changes in our community and the increased use of telehealth. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is also very, very helpful. So what I'm hearing in general, you know, is that, you know, even the university themselves, you know, have to add additional classes or training, you know, and so, you know, now I, I think, you know, different, um, you know, like, um, you know, social work, you know, they have the national, you know, accreditation body. And so I think, you know, when, when we're waiting for, you know, some curriculum to be required or standardized, you know, it seems to me that, you know, it's also probably be better, you know, to have some sort of like a standard practice. So, you know, it seems like that, you know, that classes that, you know, that added by Ben, wonderful. I think, you know, that's definitely, you know, it seems to me that, you know, hearing from, you know, the public that uh, maybe adding a one time you know, class for, for telehealth, you know, would be really good, you know, just to kind of make sure that, you know, that, um, you know, the, the trainees, you know, and, um, and, um, you know, the, um, um, interns associates, you know, coming to the, you know, to the board that, you know, that when the university haven't taken care of them, then at least we have the requirement there, you know, to protect the public. And so, and it looks like supervisor, you know, that will be another, you know, another issues. So, but it looks, it looks like that there is another hand up. And so um, maybe moderator, let's, let's hear from Myra. Myra Hernandez, your line is open and you'll have three minutes. Hi there, my name is Myra Hernandez. I am a clinical director for a training facility here in Fresno, California through our university. And I do want to follow up with what the um, other public members have said that um, at least in my experience since the pandemic has started, we've been really uh, diligent in the way we implement protocols and policies in place um, with training our um, trainees. We train about every year an average of 80 MFCC trainees. Um, that come through our program and graduate every year. So for us, it's very important that we're diligent in, in the training that we offer, especially in supervision. Um, and I know the feedback um, has been about, you know, us to, as, as instructors and supervisors getting these students prepared, but the feedback I received from the um, community leaders who are hiring our trainees is that, you know, they are better prepared with the things that we are doing at our center. Um, I also took Ben Caldwell's uh, training in supervision and telehealth as well and, and, and followed some of those protocols that he had there in place um, and also following the BBS guidelines that already were in place. So I just wanted to add to that, that as um, a representative of a university, we are being diligent and following all the guidelines in place and um, getting our students trained to the best of our abilities based on the information that is already out there. Um, and so I think that from the community itself um, as the hiring uh, clinicians out there, um, it's, the feedback has been positive at least. Thank you. Thank you very much, Myra. You know, I have no doubt that, um, you know, supervisor, you know, it's, it's and agencies are trying their very best, you know, to, um, you know, to catch up and to really prepare, you know, our staff, you know, the staff, you know, to, you know, to deal with, to provide the service. 
so you know so at the board's level you know i think it, it's very apparent that you know that because right now everybody is doing their own thing you know so for us you know how do we set, set the standard you know, so that we can actually provide that very competent uh, mental health services, you know, so that we can have, um, you know, we can achieve, you know, the, the mission of the, um, the uh, public protection. So it seems to me that, you know, that it's, you know, before, you know, now, you know, the need is there. And it looks like the CEU need is also there. <laughs> You know, so I I think the question come back to Roseanne, you know, it's about like, you know, that, um, you know, should we, you know, specify, you know, the topics, should we be open, you know, how many units and, you know, that kind of the recommendation, you know, can it be done by, you know, for example, you know, just like the suicide, you know, risk assessment, you know, maybe something that, you know, by, you know, verification, you know, from this. You know, I mean, you know, seeing you is one pathway. The other pathway would be, you know, maybe, you know, if the agency or the supervisor can verify that this is, you know, and, and as part of their training, you know, then they can actually, you know, also, you know, use that letter, you know, to, you know, to, to, um, you know, to, to, you know, what is not replacement, but to basically, you know, to, you know, make it similar, you know, to that, you know, to fulfill that requirement. There you go. So, um, okay, I, I throw in throw out a lot of the, uh, you know, I think we have a really vibrant discussion. So, Rosanna, where should we go? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I think that, you know, we have to, like, start somewhere and then we can adjust as, as time goes on, you know, if, if there's different thoughts. But my thought from talking about this is there seems to be an interest in, um, kind of doing the the coursework a little bit like the suicide risk assessment and intervention. Um, that's a recent bill that ran. It has pretty good language. It was vetted pretty well. Um, I don't know if there's an appetite to, to try drafting it with that language. Um, you know, it wouldn't that language doesn't go too in de into detail of of what type of what the, the coursework has to cover, but it, um, it just says it has to cover it and it it also is written so that it captures licensees and also it captures um you know new licensees cover new people coming in um, so we could start there and then take a look at, at what it looks like written in that form and maybe discuss the implications um it may not be there may need to be some tweaks it may not be perfect once we look at it um for this particular topic but i think that's a good starting point in terms of the the supervisors, I don't I'm not really sure. I'm kind of hearing kind of a mixed um, on that. So for the supervision, I don't know if there's a desire that would definitely be. A little bit more complicated to do just because of the fact that it's regulations and the fact that maybe not everybody supervises via video conference and the fact that we have existing supervisors and, and new supervisors. So. Um, my my thought is to draft the language the language of the statute about the six about having six hours of coursework for everyone, um, and everyone does mean that supervisors are going to be getting coursework on on doing telehealth um, via video conference. It won't necessarily be specific to supervisors, but my my thought is that we draft it as using the suicide risk assessment as a model, um, and go from there. Yes. And I actually, you know, I, I agree with that, you know, so I think the, um, um, you know, because it's, all, it's very apparent that, you know, some has already been catching up. And so, you know, and I'm a supervisor, you know, in my, my county agency, you know, so I think, you know, that, uh, you know, without, you know, and we have been practicing telehealth and we have taken classes and stuff. So I think, you know, if we set, you know, like a number of the units, say like, you know, maybe like six units and, um, be able to, you know, model after the suicide prevention bill and that just have everybody, you know, to get started. And, um, and then just for one time, you know, one time requirement, I think that I, I'm, I'm okay with it. And then I think for the supervisor, you know, I, I pretty much feel that, you know, that it should actually be an added component you know, to the, um, you know, to the courses, you know, to like, you know, it's, it's a possible topic, you know, that can be covered, you know, by the, uh, you know, by, you know, the, 
um, you know, by the, you know, the supervision classes itself, you know, because there's just so much more intricate thing, you know, it's not just about, you know, how, or put it this way, you know, or, you know, supervisor may need to know more about like, you know, um, I think one of our public members said about like, you know, in crisis, how do you deal with this? So I, I think, you know, so Roseanne, maybe this is a good question for you. You know, do we have any regulations to, you know, delineate the requirement of the supervision classes? No, oh. it's just a one time 15 hour course. So I think that there's a discussion on, do we really want to start putting topics in there? Right. We can. Um, or do we feel, I mean, this would be interesting to hear from some of the educators um, and the public, um, maybe Ben, um, you know, is it something if, if there's a demand, if people want to be doing supervision via video conferencing, depending on what law changes the board makes to allow it, if, if it's, if it's something that's more going to become more common and the, the individuals already have training on how to do therapy that way, do we want to start going down a road where we're delineating topics? For the for the supervision refresher or the supervision one time course, I would think they might get added in on their own. Um, but but that's an interesting question that I don't necessarily know the answer to. Right, but I'd like to get kind of a read from the audience of what they what they think from the educators. Yeah, so I can speak from the direct supervisor point of view, you know, doing super. I do group and I also do triadic and I also do individual. It is different, you know, it is very different, you know, and I recently just met with uh, one of the supervisee, you know, one of my supervise, supervisee, I was seeing her on video for one year and I go, oh my God, you're actually shorter than I think. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like, you know, it, it's that epiphany, you know, about like the lack of reading, you know, for the body language, a lot of the cues that actually would lose, you know, just because we don't have that face to face. And so it is different. You know, and it's not the same as individual, that's for sure. And group supervision particularly can be very challenging, you know, and um, so that's that's my take. But I would also love to hear from the, you know, from the educator or the, you know, current supervisor that, uh, you know, you know, whether they feel like, you know, that the education is needed, you know, doing, you know, the um, supervision via tel uh, teleconferencing. So, you know, maybe at this point, you know, we can open up the, the Q&A moderator, please. Yes, our Q&A remains open. And we do have a comment from Myra Hernandez on behalf of another individual who cannot uh, utilize our comment features. Myra, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Uh, hi. Uh uh, this was in response to the um, initial um, question I had commented over um, training, so I'm not sure if this might be adequate for this, but I'll, you guys tell me, but she, this is Jessica Bloom Welford, and she said, I can't make a comment due to be, be being at work, but if anyone wants to add that uh, our data comparably to the last two years shows a decrease in no-show rates by 33% for clients since implementing telehealth particularly those in more uh, rural areas, telehealth gave physical and language accessibility across the Central Valley in particular, and for telehealth supervision, a lot of creations of satellite sites housing in-person employees, more rural districts. Thank you. Thank you. And then you have Ben Caldwell. Ben, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. And uh, Christina, just to what you're saying, I had the chance to meet some coworkers uh, yesterday for the first time in more than a year. And, and we had that same realization of, oh, wow, you're not the same height I thought you were. <laughs> um, so I, I can relate. Um, as to the question of uh, telehealth supervision training, I, I think the most important thing for me from a from a training perspective is that the uh, the the training requirement line up with the policy. And so if telehealth supervision is going to be allowed across supervision settings on an ongoing basis, then it makes sense to ensure that every supervisor is trained in providing supervision via telehealth. And as it is right now on Simple Practice Learning, we've got a, a three-hour uh, course that I did on online supervision that includes things like how do you do live supervision online, a whole bunch of other uh, related topics. If, however, 
you're not ultimately going to allow supervision across all contexts, uh, excuse me, online supervision across all, all contexts and settings, then it doesn't make sense to require supervisors to be trained in an area that uh, in at least some work settings they wouldn't be making use of. Um, so to me, the most important thing is alignment. There's certainly uh, enough available scholarship and content out there uh, to make for a, a substantive addition to training coursework. Thank you. Good, good to know. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, moderator, maybe we can move on to the next one. We can't. And if Ben, if I can ask you to lower your hand, please. And our next comment comes from Brittany Barger. Brittany, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Hi, um, this is Brittany Barger, LMFT and clinical supervisor. I just wanted to chime in and also say that the I think biggest area that I've noticed as a clinical supervisor working with telehealth with trainees and associates who I see via telehealth and they're seeing clients via telehealth um, is the protocol related to crisis type issues and being able to identify where the client's at and send emergency services if needed. Um, I will say for myself, because I had no other option, I researched all the literature out there on telehealth and um, found my own trainings and, and other existing CEUs that existed so that I could be more competent and able to direct the trainees and associates on how to cope with these situations. Um, so I I'm tend to be in agreement that there is already CEUs and things out there and um, Again, not if all supervisors are able to provide the telehealth supervision, then it makes sense to weave that into the uh, biannual supervision coursework or whatever you want. Um, but I, I just wanted to chime in as well and just say that the, the biggest issue that's arose is kind of coping with crisis situations are different in person versus via telehealth and to make sure that there is adequate training and protocol around that. So at the agencies I've been at, we've created our own protocols um, just to ensure client safety. Um, so just wanted to give an additional perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think you know what what you mentioned really is uh, definitely showing the limitation of the um, you know, the tele, you know, of the telehealth, you know, and so how do you respond, you know, and also, you know, it, it, it's different because when you see the person in person, when the client in person, you know, I think you can have a very established, uh, you know, um, protocol, you know, so I, I think this is definitely, you know, also a new area, you know, for sure, you know, to continue to explore. So education, yes, looks like it's uh, also, a, you know, a, you know, I need it. And, 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 you know, a necessity. So um, let's move to the next one. Okay, and Brittany, if I can please ask you to lower your hand. Our next comment comes from Michelle Crawford Morrison. Michelle, your line is open and you'll have three minutes. Hi, can you hear me at this time? We can. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I am an educator at the University of Phoenix and I also co-direct the uh, Counseling Center, which has been virtual since May of 2020. And I would go along with some of the comments that have been shared there. There's always a learning curve, but one of the things I agree that we've learned is um, there needs to be a protocol for how to handle crisis situations. And I think that, you know, we've got that kind of fundamentally resolved now, but, I, but there could definitely be some guidelines on that. I think the question that I would, or the point that I would like to comment on with two. Number one, we find it has been extremely effective um, in terms of positive feedback from students and clients. So the student experience, I haven't had any negative student experiences. I'm sure there probably are some out in the world, but we just haven't had any. Um, client experience has been positive. I feel that at this point, people who are not interested in doing telehealth will seek out in person face to face, especially since the COVID regulations are dropping. But as mentioned by many other people, there are just a lot of folks who benefit from telehealth and find the accessibility incredibly convenient. In terms of training, I think if we had a six hour, I would like to just say 
I don't think that there's a need to have continuing education for both supervision and for using. I think that there it could be incorporated into one. And I think that we have to remember that the code of ethics that we have does have a competency component to it. So if we trust that our licensed clinicians and supervisors are being ethical, then they are always working within their field of competency. So there would be, to me, there would be some, like not having two six hour trainings in telehealth for supervisors and for, for, um, for clinicians. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Good reminder. Very, very good reminder. So thank you so much. Um, our next um, comment. Our next comment comes from Mary Reed. Mary, your line is open and you will have three minutes. Hello, uh, I'm the director of clinical training at Cal State Fullerton, so an MFT educator. I'm also a direct supervisor for an agency and I'm the alumni coordinator for our uh, program. So I, I look at the training pipeline in segments, if you will. I look at it for students who are about to enter and just beginning seeing clients. And I think that some of these telehealth issues will by necessity have to be involved in the practicum classes. I'm assuming we're not gonna make actual decisions today until there's been the survey that was alluded to uh, from CAMF that, that when we get survey information back from all participants, I think that'll be helpful. But certainly students coming in and beginning to see clients who have never done that will have to have telehealth as part of their repertoire. It's one of the tools that they'll be using and we were all forced into it, you know, uh, full stop uh, back last March. So, um, but people who beginning haven't been. People who are in the pipeline and have already done practicum, have used telehealth, but are not yet licensed might have to have a different segment uh, just to make sure that everything is lined up and people are using the word protocol. I think that's an excellent way to look at it. Uh, things like Ben's class, et cetera. And then people who have graduated but are not licensed, they wouldn't have a school class. They'd have to do something, maybe a CE unit or something like that, just as a one-time thing. That won't continue because pretty soon the beginning pipeline of students coming through having had that um, opportunity to learn uh, that'll be taken care of and won't be forever. I kind of visualize that for supervisors in the same way that um, there might need to be a one time. Don't don't forget as you supervise, you need to cover how to do it remotely, but also you wouldn't need to be continued after that. It could be included in the 15 hour as you start to supervise. Don't forget you're going to need to know how to supervise uh, for telehealth in case and we all know this is not the only pandemic that's going to happen. I mean, the, the viruses are smarter, so and there's more of them than there are of us, but um, being prepared in any moment to be able to shift uh, fully into telehealth, I think is something at least our generation is going to remember. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much. That is a very good and constructive comment. And moderator, our next one. Our next one comes from Ellen Herson. And Ellen, I see you raised your hand and typed your comment. I'm going to unmute your microphone. And if you'd like to state your comment, you may. Otherwise, um, if you'd like, I can read it for you. What would be your preference? I'm happy to read it. Okay. Uh, it's first time, so not sure no which part to do. So my name is Ellen Herson. I'm an associate marriage and family therapist up in Northern California. And I've had the the experience of both in person and telehealth. And my question is, if it is decided to add the required training for telehealth supervision, as we've all been discussing here, and it is said to possibly take one to two years to change regulation, what happens come June 30th upon the current waiver ending? And I'm specifically referring to the part of the waiver allowing telehealth supervision for associates working under supervision in a private practice. Steve, would you like to explain? Or should we? Uh, sh or can we? Um, <laughs> this is Sabina. Yeah. Um, I have to remind you what our topic is right now. It's about our coursework. Um, I know a lot of it overlaps. I get it, of course. Um, but we are talking about the potential for the coursework. Um, unfortunately, right now would not be a good time to talk about the waivers. 
Sure. Sorry, misunderstanding there. <laughs> that's that's okay. It's, it all overlaps. I get it. <laughs> and I'll try to keep that in mind for when we have that discussion. So in case you forget, and then Chris, I'll also remind you, you have a question hopefully still out there when we get to that point. So. Thank you so much. You know, it, it's very complicated and I know it overlaps. So I think, you know, you know, that's okay. You know, there are things that we just can and cannot respond. So thanks Sabina and thanks Steve. So let's move to our next, um, um, uh, Public comments. All right. Our next comment comes from Darlene Davis. Darlene, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all the work that everyone is doing to try to catch up with what's happened in the last year and a half. Um, I did want to speak to a few things. One is, um, Christina, I was thinking about that this morning about how I met some of the associates um, in person and I went, wow, you're different than what I imagined. But I think that I'm looking at that as a good thing, that some of that implicit bias that we might have in our head is gone. It's left to what we see on the screen and that can open up um, better supervision. I don't know for sure, but that's my thought. And then I also wanted to speak to um, telling supervisors what specific trainings to take. Uh, I think my um, uh, participation with other supervisors or other agency directors, it's really hard to find supervisors these days. And the more um, stipulations we put on them, the more they're saying, ah, you know, I'll just stick to my private practice. So I feel like it could be a barrier um, I also believe that supervisors want to be competent in what they do. And if their students and associates know how to use this training, uh, use this platform, um, they're going to want to get educated in that. And so my thought is to leave it to the trainers and the training because people will seek out trainings that offer telehealth in their supervision training, um, especially if this becomes a norm. I like what Ben said is it has to kind of follow what the law says. If, if telehealth is going to be a part of what we're doing, then um, let's have trainings that also um, address that. And I think that would be better left to the trainers, but there's nothing wrong with putting it in the first 15 hours training for the new supervisors. And then crises, I think there is some overlap between how we handle crises in person and with telehealth. And so, again, supervisors want to uh, be competent in that area. Um, and let's see if that's all. And um, I'm Darlene Davis from Hope Counseling Center. I'm the director, also supervisor, and also have been an ed educator for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darlene. Um, that is really, really wonderful feedback. So any other public uh, comments? That looks like all we have. Okay. So this is such a wonderful and robust discussion. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm hearing that, you know, pretty consistently. That's kind of what I heard. And so, you know, so it looks like the one time, you know, one time, um, um, you know, the CE requirement, you know, might be good, you know, for everybody. And then for the supervisor, you know, it looks like that the 15 hours, you know, that telehealth could be, you know, a good topic. And then, you know, continuing um, for the supervisors wise may, you know, may, may basically just leave it, you know, for their, their own choice. So am I hearing it correct or any other, um, I don't know, any other changes? Roseanne, what do you think? I'm hearing, um, it sounds like from what I'm hearing, um, moving forward, we would um, draft the, the using the suicide risk assessment language for all, for all associates or, or all pre-licensees and, um, and licensees upon licensure. So, um, in terms of what that means for, I think we, 
in order for the for the supervision via video conferencing kind of based on what I'm hearing, we need to see we need to have that discussion, which is which is item I believe it's eight in our agenda. So my thought would be to to draft the um the language for all for all licensees um and then bring that language back to the next meeting. Um by then we will have had the supervision via video conference discussion. We can discuss at that time whether it feels like it also needs to go in the the supervision 15 hour course or if we feel like that can be an as needed or we we trust that it's it's kind of already been done um, by the individual that that chooses to supervise via video conference. Mm -hmm. So, does, does so board members, yeah, sounds um, sounds is is it a good direction because it looks like that we can start with you know that's. Um, you know, apply to all and then down the road, you know, we can yeah. take a look at, you know, what's, uh, you know, what else we need to change. I see not it. I see. Okay. So, Roseanne, in that sense, you know, now do we or, or Sabina, do we need a discussion? I mean, no motion. No, I mean, no, this, this is uh, the board staff has their direction and this is not agendized for any kind of motion. It was just an overview and discussion to give staff. I have an idea of what they should be doing in the background until your next meeting. Yeah, that would be really good. So, Roseanne, I hope you have what you, you know, you, you know, you need what, you know, you have what you need. There you go. My words are just scrambling my head. Wonderful. <laughs> so, in that, at this time, you know, if you, you're good, then we move on and let's move on to the break. <laughs> so, <laughs> let's do a little break time. Now the time is 1026. Let's come back and at uh, 1040. Okay, so are we back? Looks like we have everybody. So moderator, um, you know, should we get started? We are ready when you are. Okay, I think we are. Yes. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So welcome back to uh, the Board of Behavioral Sciences uh, Telehealth Committee meeting. And the time now is 1042 and we will uh, resume the meeting. And uh, I, I believe the next uh, discussion item is to uh, discuss the potential amendments to clarify telehealth law for associates and trainees. And Roseanne, please take it away. Okay. so. Um, this memo is a continuation of the discussion that we had at the March 26th meeting. And so I've included, based on that discussion, some, some potential proposed amendments um, that we can discuss today and make changes to as needed. Um, we've, the COVID-19 state of emergency has made it very clear that as the profession evolves, we need to evolve our, our make some changes and clarifications to our laws, uh, our statutes and regulations regarding practice and supervision via telehealth. Um, we're getting a lot of questions and a lot of uh, people are practicing in that modality where they were not before. And so it's raised a lot of new scenarios that the law just doesn't quite address. Um, we've the the um, the state government has has allowed us uh, to address it during the COVID-19 state of emergency um, via our waivers. I know a lot of you uh, have asked questions about the waivers. Um, the extensions of the waivers is not up to the board. Um, the, the, the waivers, um, the board doesn't have authority to grant law waivers, um, on its own. If it's something's in law, then the board has to pursue a law change or regulation change, statute of regulation change, either via, via a bill, if applicable or a regulation package, um, to do a law change. The reason we were able to do the waivers is because the governor granted the director of the department, um, certain emergency powers to um to do law waivers but when the state of emergency ends those emergency powers will go away um and so the waivers are in the process of winding down um and the decision of when the waivers will wind down is up to um it's a it's a joint conversation between the dca department and kind of the higher levels of government at the state as they 
coordinate and look at what's happening with the with the COVID case numbers um, and decide best how to proceed. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with the waivers. Um, I know a lot of people are eager to hear about the June 30th waiver. Um, we've asked for as much advance notice on what's happened with that as possible. So hopefully we'll have some news to share soon. But in thinking ahead, we really need to figure out how, if, if, if there's areas of the law that need to be clarified, we need to figure out um, how to clarify the, the existing statute. So that's what we're here to do today. Um, so in terms of associates and telehealth, I'll start with that first. Um, AMFT um, and trainees are both explicitly in the law already permitted to perform services via telehealth. We actually have a code section in Business and Professions Code section 4980.43.3 for MFTs, subsection I, that says an associate or trainee can provide services via telehealth in their scope of practice. So that covers uh, MFT trainees. Um, licensed clinical social workers and licensed professional clinical counselors acts are silent about the matter, as is LEP law. Um, however, associate clinical social workers and associate professional clinical counselors are permitted to perform services via telehealth because of Business and Professions Code Section 2290.5. Um, it permits somebody to provide telehealth who is licensed under this division. And the Business and Professions Code actually has a provision that says anybody who is considered licensed, that, in, that encompasses registrants as well. So that means that a person who's licensed under this division, that includes LEPs, that includes APCCs, and that includes ASWs. However, um, I think that there is some need to clarify in the law that, that APCCs and ASWs um, can do, do um, provide services via telehealth because there's already that explicit um, statement in MFT law that they can. Um, and so in this year's omnibus bill, which is going to be SB 801, there is actually, we're pursuing an amendment um, that would state that um, a, that it would basically be a corresponding amendment that those individuals can also provide services via telehealth. So that's being, being pursued in this year's om, omnibus bill, SB 801. Um, and so I don't think we need to worry about that for today because that's already going to be clarified. However, there's some questions about trainees and telehealth. Um, the law does not specifically address whether social work interns, um, social, work, social workers use the term intern for their um, master's degree students instead of trainee, and professional clinical counselor trainees can provide services via telehealth. Presumably, they're, they're, because they're not included in the definition of a licensee in Business and Professions Code 23.8, um, the, presumably, the answer may be no, um, because they're not in any way registered with the board and are not regulated by the board yet. However, MFT trainees are already included as providers who can perform services, um, and the law is silent on trainees and interns. So, um, because the law is silent, it is assumed that, that it is permitted um, because it is not prohibited. So, some possible amendments that um, that staff is recommending in attachment A is to amend Business and Professions Code section 2290.5 to specify that professional clinical counselor trainees may provide services via telehealth. We're already this year clarifying associates, so that's already being done as we speak. Um, but we we do, you know, staff does feel that it's important to include um, APCC trainees. Um, we did not include um, interns in that discussion, in that in that proposed piece of the amendment, NASW of California has specifically um, asked that we not include interns um, because they note that social work schools already have their own policies. And so they've asked us that we leave interns out and leave the law silent on that. So the draft that you see honors that request. Um, we also are, are requesting to amend section 499.46.3J of LPCC law and uh, to correspond with the already existing clarification in LMFT law that trainees may perform services via telehealth. So you'll see that particular amendment in attachment A. And then finally, um, 
there may be a desire to consider possible amendments to business and professions code section 4980.42 and 4999.36 for LMFT law and LPCC law. The state experience via telehealth is at the discretion of the school and supervisor. So I've included a couple, uh, if you look in your packet, I've included a couple of pieces of language to choose from that basically talks about trainee services and that um, allowance of experience hours being at the discretion of the school and supervisor. So that's something that um, that should be discussed. Um, Christina, do we want to discuss attachment A first, or do you okay, or do you want to move me to move forward? I think actually this is a good place to stop and you okay. know really look at it because I think you know it's a two distinctive issues. And so I think I would like to let's open to the board members to see if you have any comments, Chris or Susan. Let's go with Chris first. Um, I, I think I'm I'm in agreement. You know, if uh, the the trainees are not under our jurisdiction, um, that that I'm I, I'm comfortable leaving that up to the <clears throat> to the training institutions on how they want to regulate their um, you know their their trainees. Um, I don't I don't it might be an overstep for us. Um, so, but I, I yeah I mean I don't I don't see a whole lot of uh, of issue with that. I think that the amendments that Roseanne um, is uh, recommending makes sense, um, and uh, you know it seems to be seems to me pretty straightforward. Susan, any any comments? Susan, can you unmute yourself, please? Sorry, I forgot. Um, and yeah, I wanted to <clears throat> excuse me. Thank Roseanne for carving all that out. And because I know it's not that easy, and I, I of course agree with it because she knows what she's talking about. <laughs> and um, I also agree that we should let the schools of the institution schools decide how they're going to deal with their trainees. Very good, very good. So um, let's open to the um, um, the public. To uh, for comments, so uh, moderator, please open a Q and A panel. This is the moderator. I've opened that Q and A panel. If you'd like to make a comment, you can utilize either the hand raise feature by locating that small hand icon on your screen, and you can click on that to raise and lower your hand. And you can also use use the Q and A feature by clicking on that Q and A icon on your screen and typing comment or I would like to make a comment into the text field. In our first. Comment comes from Sierra Smith. Sierra, your line is open and you will have three minutes. Good morning. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful consideration of this topic. Um, I run a nonprofit community counseling center, Open Paths Counseling Center in uh, the Los Angeles area of California, serving um, low income and marginalized communities. And we use trainees and associates, um, MFT, PCCs, and uh, MSWs as well. And what I wanted to just confirm, because as a non-exempt setting, I understand that we have the option to continue with telehealth. But what I'm curious about is the acceptance, and this falls both for supervision as well as for direct services, of virtual therapy as a non-exempt setting when folks go to apply for licensure for counting those hours because even though we can provide it i would want to make sure that it would be accepted for all of the folks that we use so that we didn't inadvertently put folks in a position of only getting virtual hours if that was a route that they ended up going and then finding out that they should have had a broader spectrum of hours where some were in person so that we can prevent any inadvertent uh mishaps with the clinicians as they move forward. That's my question. Thank you. Well, so Roseanne, go ahead. Okay, let me make sure I, I clear. So um Sierra, you're saying that your your um your organization, it's not a it's not an exempt setting, but it's not a private practice. So it's a non-exempt setting. It kind of falls in the middle. It um, is so no, it is an exempt it, it is an exempt setting. 
It is an exempt yes, setting. Yes, we are a five hundred one c three nonprofit. We are an okay. exempt setting, so I know we're not regulated, but I want to make sure that we're still providing our clinicians with what they're going to need to accrue. So recognizing that we don't. We can continue to do virtual supervision. We can continue to do virtual telehealth, both of which we'll do. But I want to make sure that we don't inadvertently prevent somebody who's going through with only that if that's what they're seeking or that's how it turns out when in the end they are going to be required to have a certain percentage of that in in person hours, right? Because they don't always know what they need. So I'm trying to have the understanding so that we don't inadvertently mess people up achieving their licensure. So for right now, um, you guys are you guys are an exempt setting, so um, all hours counseling clients um, with a, an associate um, at the discretion of the supervisor on the site, if they feel that it's appropriate and it's kind of at the supervisor's discretion, then the then the associate may may do um, do telehealth with counseling with their clients. Um, in terms of supervision, right now for an exempt setting. Um, the law just says supervision is allowed to be a video conferencing. Um, so, so um, that would, of course, be you know based on the appropriateness of, of if the supervisor feels that it's appropriate and the setting feels it's appropriate. We're going to be talking about the the video supervision in the next setting. So, um, whether or not it's appropriate to allow all of that to be via video conferencing um, for an exempt setting. That could potentially change in the future. Right now, it's permitted, um, so it would take a uh, it would take a law change to change that, and you would know about it. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure we didn't put anybody in a precarious position when they went to submit their hours. Right, right. Totally understand. Yeah, it's very understandable, and and yet you know it's also kind of like on the you know you know it. it Overlaps, you know, so I think, you know, in our next agenda item, we can talk about, you know, I'll talk about the, you know, that portion of the regulations a little bit more um, in depth. So let's move to, uh, but uh, thank you. Thank you for your, for your comments. And so, um, uh, Roseanne, you have something to add or? No, um, no, we can move on to the public okay. comment. Let's move on. Okay, so uh, moderator, who is the next? Uh, yeah, so. Our next comment comes from Farah, and I apologize if I mispronounce your last name, Zerahi. Um, your line is open, and you'll have three minutes. Hi there. Um, you did great with my name. Uh, my name is Fada Zerahi. I'm uh, an AMFT in Southern California in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles area. I'm actually hailing from a Costco currently, so. Thank you for uh, giving us all the opportunity to kind of speak up and ask questions. Um, I wanted to, you know, talk about the really, I know that everyone's always talking about the waivers and whatnot. And I just want to make the point that, you know, many of us AMFTs and ACE, you know, associate social workers and APCCs have been put in a really weird position where we've had to make changes to our lives during the global pandemic. We've been allowed to do telehealth supervision during that time in private practice settings. And so many of our li many of us have our livelihoods kind of depending on the capacity to continue doing that. I understand that it requires a law change for that to uh, be something that's a permanent change, but I'm curious what's gonna happen to account for those of us that are kind of stuck in the middle where we are established in our jobs and have um, currently telehealth supervision in a private practice setting but are not maybe not able to regularly meet with our supervisors in person once the waiver expires. Um, I'm curious, like what sort of advocacy the board is doing, um, and you know what sort of solutions you all have for us. Thank you. So thank you so much, Farah. So it looks like you know this is another topic. You know that actually we can talk more. You know at the next discussion item, and so let's right now you know really focus on about you know the clarifying the language. You know for the, you know the telehealth law for associates and trainees. So that's really you know where we're where we're at now, and so stay tuned and definitely you know save your comment until the next um, you know the next discussion. So um, any other uh, public comments? Uh, that looks like uh, that completes our public comments at this time. And if I could just remind Father to lower her hand, please.
That's awesome. Thank you so much, moderator. So now in that sense, so looks like, you know, that's, um, you know, hearing from, you know, the public also, you know, I'm not hearing any, you know, any uh, disagreement, you know, that we should be clarifying, you know, all these um, uh, sections of the, the law. And so, um, in that sense, Roseanne, you know, do you think that we have, um, you know, what, what you need? So what I would ask, um, as mostly I have what I need, um, what I would ask is, do you, in looking at, at section 4980.42 on page um, seven, I, there's two different, uh, under trainee services, and this applies to LPCCs as well, not ASL, LCSWs, but um, I've drafted two different things um, talking about um, hours of experience gained via telehealth for uh, specifically for trainees. Um, one of them is very simple and just says our allowance of experience hours gained via telehealth shall be the, at the discretion of the school and the supervisor. Or I drafted a second option that says the school and the supervisor shall assess the appropriateness of allowing a trainee to gain any hours of experience via telehealth. In making the assessment, the school and the supervisor shall take into account such factors as the ability of the trainee and the appropriateness of the client uh, of telehealth for the client. So that one's a little bit more specific. That's kind of um, when we've gotten that question. That's kind of the language that we've used um, to sort of advise, you know, during COVID, if you know, hey, please make sure that it's appropriate for that particular client and that particular trainee because they are brand new. Um, so I, I would be curious if there is a preference between which of those subsection F's we should select. That is a really, really good thing that we have choices. <laughs> so Susan, go ahead. Well, I like them both, Roseanne, but I think the second one is so much more specific. Maybe that's dangerous. Is it dangerous to be so much more specific? It, you make a good point. It can be in certain situations that typically leaving the law vague in some situations is good. Um, if you're more specific, it can, you know, have some unintended consequences. Although I don't know, uh, I'd be interested to hear from our educators probably that, that deal with trainees. I mean, it's, they're pretty specific factors. The ability of the trainee, obviously, that should be a consideration, I think, and the appropriateness for the client. I don't think those are too controversial. Um, no. So it's still pretty general. I mean, um, it's just, it's, I wrote that in there as kind of a reminder of, you know, hey, if it's not appropriate for your trainee or if it's the, for some reason you have reservations about the client, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Um, so, that's why I wrote that one that way, but there is the option to keep it more very general if, if we prefer. That's that's a good reminder. Sometimes more specific can be, you know, can lead to some, you know, you, you just don't know. At the same time, you know, I think that's also a very important thing because once since, you know, the, the language right now is called such factors as, you know, and those are just examples. And I can already think about like, you know, the very important thing is about the confidentiality, you know, so, you know, so I think, you know, once you have, you know, so, so by it, it's a good compromise between not making it too specific, but, you know, to as a good reminder to think about the areas, you know, that can, you know, influence, you know, the, um, you know, the appropriateness, you know, of um, telehealth. So, um, I actually, I personally, I like the second one better, you know, just to give some parameters as a reminder. So, Chris, what do you think? I agree, uh, Christina. I, I, I do like the second one a little bit better um, because I don't, I don't think that you know one size fits all. So, um, you know, giving uh, a little bit more discretion to the, uh, you know, to the trainers about the type of uh, supervision that is. Um, that's most appropriate in service delivery, that's most appropriate for the training and the client. I think it serves both our ability to uh, serve consumer protection and also trains, um, you know, give, gives, uh, you know, a little bit more ability to, to make sure that we're, that we're training our future uh, service providers well. Yes. 
very good. Thank you. So maybe we can open to the you know to the Q and A and see if uh, what the educators and the you know the public's experience and preference. So moderator, your turn. <laughs> we have opened the Q and A panel. If you'd like to make a comment. As requested by Vice Chair Wong, please click on that Q&A icon on your screen, type comment in the text box, or use that hand raise feature by locating the small hand icon somewhere on your screen. Typically, it's at the bottom of your participant list, but from what I understand, not always. So it looks like we have one. We do, Sierra. Sierra, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Hi, um, I just wanted to share that for us, at least, I don't know how it is for other larger organizations, it can be tricky to get a lot of ongoing conversation between professors in the university and our clinical supervisors who have very limited time and are often fitting in supervision amongst private practice, other community agencies are working with in their own lives. So. I preferred the first one because it sounded like it required less interaction between the supervisors and the and the school and that they could make those decisions based on what's happening boots on the ground, either with the practicum class or the supervisor who may have a broader context of what's going on than the practicum professor. I think both of those as the folks who oversee the um, the clinical component of what the trainee is doing they can each use their judgment about that. But I worry about something that requires there being this conversation for each clinician, each client between supervisor and professor. I think that that can be interpreted that way in the second one, and that could be a challenge. Um, I do have a suggestion, which, you know, I think you bring up a really good point, you know, is to, you know, for, for F, the school and the supervisor can be changed to the school and or the supervisor, you know, that would, yeah, and that would actually, you know, open up, you know, in terms of in terms of a semantic that you don't have to go through, run to the school every single time, but and or so that they can actually, you know, have that option. I appreciate that. I think that solves exactly what I was hoping for. So thank you. You're welcome. That's why we have the public comments. Thank you. <laughs> so moderator, anybody else? It looks like that's it for now. Awesome. So let's close the PQ&A and uh, come back to the board members and, and Roseanne. And so, so F, you know, like the, the lengthy one, the lengthier one, you know, sounds like that, that is the way to go. So right now, so would you like to, you know, I think we do need to have a motion for this one, right? Okay. Okay. So what would be the motion? Um, the motion would be to, um, Adopt the amendments in um, in attachment A and for 4980.42 and 4999.32 to adopt the second um, option F with amendments to yes. answer. I will make that motion. Uh, any other? I need a second. I'll second it. And Chris second. So Chris. Christina first, Chris, uh, Chris uh, second. So um, let's open to the public and see any other comments. Moderator, please. This is the moderator. We begin with the Q&A panel and the, also the hand raise feature is activated. Uh, we have a comment from Julie Cohen. Yes, Julie, go ahead. Let me find her. Oh, there she is. Okay. Julie, your line is open. I noticed you typed in your comment. Did you want to uh, state it for the record or would you like me to read it? Oops. Um, you can um, you can read it. It's okay. My apologies. 
Okay, the comment from Julie Cohen says, I am a supervisor in a for-profit telehealth corporation. I've heard that possibly when the waiver expires, there will be a differentiation between private practice and profit corporations. Some of the BBS supervision forms do not differentiate between for-profit and private practice. I am wondering if forms will be updated to clarify the type of for-profit type that it will be. So it looks like this is another comment that probably more pertain to the, our next discussion items. So um, we will definitely, you know, let's table that. And, you know, at the, when we are talking about like the, the supervision of the teleconferencing, you know, please bring it up again. So um, thank you so much. And any other um, comments? None at this time. Thank you. So I think we're ready to vote. Um, so Christina? Yes, I'd like to remind you that um, the motion was to adopt those amendments, but this is actually a recommendation, and I'm not sure if this is a recommendation to the board or to the PNA committee, but I wanted to make to you know put that reminder out there that this is a recommendation. Roseanne, go ahead. My thought is, that, well, depending on the, uh, we can kind of discuss at the end of the meeting whether you want the amendments based on other amendments that you might want. Whether you want the amendments to come back to the committee one more time. My thought is that we have another committee meeting of the telehealth meeting meeting where we look at all the, the approved amendments as a whole one more time before we okay. refer it on to P and A, um, because this is kind of we're doing this. We're talking top top tackling interrelated topics piece by piece. But I want to be able to take a look at them as a whole and not send some of them to committee, a different committee and hold some of them back. Um, okay, that makes sense. Thanks for that clarification. And then I'm going to call roll. Susan Friedman. Susan, could you unmute, please? Sorry. Yes. Christopher Jones. Yes. And Christina Wong. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And so for this, then we can move forward for the second half of the um, discussion. Yes. So we're going to move on to attachment B, and this is practicum clarification for the face to face requirement. Um, so the, it looks like the board has determined that all trainees. Uh, of course, at the discretion of their school and or their supervisor may be able to provide services via telehealth. So a second question that arises has to do with the wording in the statute related to face to face practicum hours. We've been getting a lot of questions um, for program from LMFT and LPCC programs and trainees. If what face to face practicum hours means can practicum hours that 150 or 225 hours. Can that be done via video conference or telehealth with clients, or does that have to be this face to face mean in person? Um, so I think that the, some clarification moving forward in the future is needed for that. Um, so both MFT and PCC trainees must have a certain number of face to face practice from hours counseling individuals, families, couples, or groups, or, or um, some combination of those groups. So this is in business and professions. Several business and professions code, as well as the out of state provisions, and then it's also in LPCC in state and out of state. Um, one place where I don't think that it should be clarified is in the um, in the older degree programs. Um, business and professions code 4980.37 and for MFTs and 4999.32 for LPCCs um, are for degree programs that must have been completed by December 2018. So. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see the value in in changing the wording of that requirement retroactively because those degrees are already granted and practicum is something that has to be integrated into the degree program. Um, so I don't see the value of changing it there unless someone can, can think of a reason why it should be. Um, also, I would I would also say that um, when we discuss the the changes that are shown here we should discuss the appropriateness for out of state keeping in mind that out of state um, schools are not designed to design their practicum towards specific california requirements so we don't want to create an unintended consequence there um, but i would direct you to attachment b um, and let's see i will turn to that page really quick here 
Um, so the, if you just look at the first page, this is the, the new MFT degree requirements, not the older 2018 um, requirements. Um, it says um, in subsection B2, a minimum of 150 hours of face-to-face -face experience counseling individuals, couples, families, or groups are required. So I've added some language, a couple, there's a couple of options. We could say something like a portion, but not all of the required face-to-face -face experience may be performed via telehealth if deemed appropriate by the school, probably the school and or supervisor. Or we could say something like the school and the supervisor shall utilize their discretion to incorporate a mix of in-person and telehealth experience. Or you can decide that it, to stay silent on it and maybe just delete the the face to face wording and leave it you know, leave the law silent and so it's it's at the discretion of the school program. So, um, and like I said, I, we'll need to revisit once we decide this for in state. Um, well, we need to re revisit it for out of state because there's some different consequences that could occur there if we if we use certain language for out of state applicants. So with that, I will open it up for discussion on attachment B. Thank you so much, Roseanne. So again, we have three options. <laughs> and it's always good to have choice. And I want to thank Roseanne for writing those um, um, languages so that we can actually consider it now. So board members, you know, what is your, um, you know, your, your, your options? You know, should we go with, you know, the, um, which one? Just maybe express your opinion. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Well, I think for California licensed people in state, it should be at the discretion of the, the school in their, in whatever they decide is going to work best for their students. I don't think that we should put too many rules and regulations on them or they're there might be a rebellion. <laughs> I mean, we sh should acknowledge that telehealth is here to stay and it's up to the discretion of the school how to incorporate that in their training. Yeah, I think that's exactly, you know, the challenge because, you know, the school said that, oh, that, you know, that they have to go for an internship, you know, go for, a, you know, traineeship, you know, and then, you know, that who is really, you know, directing this, you know, the, uh, you know, who is that guiding, you know, and what is the law here? And this is exactly why, you know, we're trying to like differentiate, you know, what would actually work the best to, you know, to set the standard. So thank you, Susan. So Chris, what do you think? Well, I'm, I, I think that, you know, leaving, leaving some of this up to this, to the, the training programs is important. What I, what I really want to think about is making sure that the, the standards that we set forth for our, for um, our, our uh, licensees is clear so that the training programs have a guideline as to how to, as how to move their, their training forward. So, um, you know, for example, if, you know, if, if we put regulations in place or, or um, you know, stipulations on how telehealth is going to be, needs to, needs to be performed or practiced, then, then that gives a roadmap to the universities on how they create their training program. So um, I think that leaving the language a little bit more, uh, not vague, but, you um, you know, loose so that they have some wiggle room in there, I think is is probably better in the long run and letting them letting them de design their programs to meet the standards of BBS when those trainees graduate and they move towards licensure. Right. So, you know, so sounds like, you know, in that sense, you know, that's, um, you know, Chris, the, um, you know, since we are talking about, you know, the uh, um, page 15, you know, that set of languages, and so, you know, so it looks like, you know, that, you know, that we should put some parameters and yet not to confine them. And so, so it looks like the school, you know, Roseanne, here you go, and or the supervisor shall utilize their discretion to incorporate a mix of in-person and telehealth experience would be probably a good sort of like a compromise. 
They have the flexibility, but we're not telling them what to do. And so just look at the appropriateness and, you know, basically decide that individual, you know, that individual trainee or, the, you know, or the um, uh, intern, you know, what would be the mode of uh, service delivery is the best. Okay, right. Okay. Am I putting words in your mouth? <laughs> I hope not, but <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm reading you right. Okay, good. So, Roseanne? Uh, one thing I would say, if, if we're going to go with that option, we should also discuss whether it should be um, the school and the super and or the supervisor. Um, should it be may or shall? Um, right now, the way that, that sentence reads, it has to be a mix. So we, we could make it may um, so that it's optional. So just throwing that out there before the discussion starts. I like that. You know what? The, it's always about these words. You know, the law, very important. Shows, very, you know, has a very different implication of may with May. So I think May will actually, you know, give even more flexibility. You know, and yet we're also setting the standard and the parameters. But you guys, you know, for the supervisor in the school has the freedom, you know, to decide what to do. I will throw one more monkey wrench into this, um, just in terms of giving the school's guidance. I have gotten a lot of questions, and this is something to keep in mind from the school, about um, you know, them them having a remote trainee um that's doing telehealth and if that's allowable and if the if the board is okay with that and if if, the, if it's at the discretion of the school you know if the trainee is located in new york for example um they could in theory I and mean, we, we haven't set the we haven't discussed supervision via video conferencing yet that would be the thing if video if supervision had to be in person they'd have to probably be in california but um you know, other things being equal right now, if it was an exempt setting, the trainee could be located somewhere else um, and the, and be remotely supervised. And as long as the school is okay with that. So um, I just want to throw that into the consideration as something to consider because we do get questions about that a lot from schools if that is okay. It is a monkey wrench. <laughs> yes, as, during COVID it has been, um, but yeah. but whether moving forward, um, that's a good thing or not, just putting that out there. Well, Roseanne, actually you bring up also a very, very important point, you know, because the bottom line is that, you know, with the online school expanding, you know, pretty exponentially, you know, so that potentially, you know, can have that ramification that, you know, that a school, you know, an online school, you know, in state of New York, you know, they can actually, you know, have that sort of like, you know, that practicing, you know, without, you know, because they're not under our purview, you know, so they can actually practice and get experience right there as far as they have, you know, they want to have a call, you know, they, they want to uh, down the road be counted as, you know, those hours as belong to California. They can have a Californian supervisor and they're in. Yeah, so that is a, yeah, that is a very good point. So, good reminder, board members, does it change your mind? <laughs> Chris, I see that you're in deep thoughts, and so does Susan, you know, any feedback? Yeah, I mean, so this is, so this is where I feel like, you know, the, the wiggle room could, could really backfire, right? Um, because there's going to be, <clears throat> this is where the, the ethics of it comes in, you know, we can do it, but should we do it? You know, and, and if we give the opportunity for that to happen, um, you know, will, will universities try? I mean, I don't, I don't even want to really go there about what could, could occur. Um, I need to think on it. No, because that's a good point, Roseanne. That's a really good point. Yes. Next thing you know, we've got, we've got people training all over the country in, in, you know, for California, um, laws and rules and they, they never do any face to face unless we require them to fly in however many times a year. I don't know. I don't know. It sounds kind of. I'd like to hear public comment too. Yes, so so Susan, anything before anything from you, you know, you feel free to. Yeah, I'm a little bit confused because people who are out of state. Are we assuming they're there because they went there because of the pandemic? Or are we assuming they got licensed in 
in California, but they live someplace else now. And if they live someplace else, aren't they required after a certain amount of time to be licensed in that place as opposed to California? I'm, I'm confused. So for, for this particular scenario, we're talking about trainees who are still in school. So they're under the jurisdiction of their school. They're not under the jurisdiction of their board yet. Like a, a associate, like an associate could in theory, um, well, that's a really complicated situation we'll talk about with supervision, but an associate could in theory um, possibly work from an work remotely from another state. The question is, this is these are but this particular um, talks of, thing talks about practicum. So these are these are specifically master's degree students that are still in their school program under the jurisdiction of their school, not the board yet. Oh, well. I guess I defer to giving the responsibility to the school again, because I don't like to give too many rules that then they go berserk and say, hey, they're giving us too many things to do. Let's not do anything. So we don't want that to happen. Yeah, thank you so much, Susan. You know, and, and you know, and sometimes, you know, there are things like it's pretty complicated that, you know, that probably licensees has a better understanding. But, you know, your opinion is just equally important. So thank you. So let's open up to the public comments since you know chris really wants to hear from the public also so any public comments and moderator maybe we can open up the q a panel this is the moderator we have opened the q a panel if you'd like to make a comment on this item that was just discussed i believe that's attachment b please uh utilize the q a panel by locating that q a icon and typing comment into the text field or you may also utilize the raised hand feature and our first comment comes from Fadas Rafi, and your line is open, and you will have three minutes. Hi there, um, it's me again. I've just been listening in on this particular issue, and though I am an associate, so this doesn't impact me, it feels a little bit like there's that same kind of pull away from allowing individuals outside of the state to practice in California if they're not doing it face to face. And I would, you know, I would push back against that fear a little bit. We've talked a lot in this meeting about how telehealth is going to be a really big part of the future. And I think that myself as a clinician, I'm hopeful that, you know, our board and, and our state is going to be working towards licensed reciprocity eventually, um, because ultimately that only benefits the public. So if that is the case, then I think that it makes sense to kind of start working towards a place where this allowing trainees um, to maybe gather hours if they're living outside of the state of California, that kind of starts to pave the way in that direction. Additionally, you know, many of you said, well, what if someone is in school, you know, elsewhere and, and seeing a supervisor here in California? Well, what if they're in school in California and they just can't live here for whatever reason? So I think that this will provide a lot of flexibility. I also agree that less regulation is better and some more flexibility for not just the clinicians, but for, you know, pra like practices and nonprofit and for profit either or. Um, but, you know, that I kind of I kind of get the feeling that there's like this fear around um, allowing for supervision via telehealth but the reality is is that we're moving in that direction and so the sooner that we kind of get there and the sooner that we uh, move in that direction and start to work out the kinks the better um, i think that if we just get restrictive on this kind of stuff now we're just going to lag behind many other states that are kind of pushing in that direction already thank you thank you so much um ben Ben Caldwell, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Yes, Ben Caldwell, MFT. I apologize. I was not present for some of the earlier part of the conversation here, but um, I have been present for the end of it and um, want to express my appreciation for the direction that you all are taking in the in the draft language. Um, certainly providing flexibility for schools and, and allowing them to determine what is appropriate um, given how they do instruction um, uh, seems like a good match here. Um, I, I wonder as it relates to that sort of state line piece if 
um, that would be biting off more than needs to be bitten off from a regulatory perspective here because there are already um, statutes and regulations in place related to out-of-state practice regardless of the the direction that you're talking about so um, I, I feel comfortable leaving it to the schools who often have very good lawyers themselves um, to determine uh, which clients their practicum students should be seeing via telehealth and, and which they should not. Um, ultimately, just I, I think flexibility here for universities and trainees is a good thing. Um, and I would echo the prior comment that this is the direction that we're heading. And so some of the folks who are in training right now uh, may actually go their whole career as 100% telehealth clinicians. Um, so that's that's the movement of the field right now. Thank you. Thanks so much. And our next uh, comment. Next comment comes from Michelle Crawford Morrison. Michelle, your line is open. You'll have three minutes. Hi, thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to jump in on this. Um, in looking at the three different possible languages for allowing telehealth for LPCC uh, trainees, I, I would see that there would be um, a benefit to having the language for the LPCC match what the language is for the MFT student trainees right now. I think that continuity, um, it, it's already confusing enough for everyone, and especially since there are several um, university programs, including the one that I teach in, that make the that are approved for dual license so those students can get licensed as an mft and or an lpcc so it would be nice to have the continuity and my last comment is on the discussion about having remote students i i i feel like that is a big issue but i'm wondering if that should be addressed in another a topic rather than in this one because that's more for me it just felt like more of a licensing issue like where was your training in, in instead of an, an educational qualification is that a licensing issue like where did you earn your licensing experience and the reality is is there are already some existing state laws about being able to conduct telehealth um in a particular like if you're if you're a resident of one state can you provide therapy in a different state. So some of that I think is already covered. Just, you know, I'm not 100% an expert on that, just a thought. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. So I just wanna, um, before we move to the next one, because of the time, you know, we do have another meeting at one o'clock. And so, you know, now I do not want to limit your expression of speech, but I think that would be really important to, you know, to uh, make your, um, you know, point being concise and precise and concise, and then we can, you know, take your, take in your, your thoughts and then, you know, we can um, make a, make a motion down the road. So, um, next one, please. And yes. Yes. Our next comment comes from. Jen Alley. And Jen, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Um, hello again, uh, committee. This has been a very uh, good and thoughtful discussion, you know, and it's a complicated issue. Um, you know, telehealth is definitely something that's been utilized a lot in the last year and, and there, you know, the transition that, um, you know, the schools and the associates and the board with the waivers, everybody went through was, you know, really complicated and, and you know, shocking how well things worked for everybody. Um, and I would just like to point out that, um, you know, there's no cap on associate experience hours using telehealth. And so to the extent that trainees are able to do it, um, you know, we just want to make sure that there's aren't newly licensed MFTs with very little experience with whom human to human, you know, therapy and contact. Um, and so, you know, we, we do think that, you know, the priority should be human to human, but acknowledge that telehealth is here and it's most likely gonna stay. Um, I would be very curious to see um, the survey responses um, from educators and trainees and get their opinion 
um, because they did use, you know, telehealth last year, um, just to see how it worked and what concerns they may have. Um, I think it would be really, you know, imperative to have that information um, before moving forward with any permanent uh, changes. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you, Jen. If I could remind you to lower your hand. Our next comment comes from Stuart Lee. Stuart, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, VBS board, uh, committee members. Uh, just really want to express my appreciation to all of you. Roseanne, especially, thank you so much for all your quick responses to my questions. Um, I just had a question about the choices that Roseanne uh, uh, was proposing around the face-to-face, -face because that has been a huge um, uh, concern for a lot of our students, like, because they're doing it telehealth. So, so what I'm hearing is, is that we're considering deleting face-to-face -face or leaving it in and wording it as such direct counseling services can include face-to-face -face and or telehealth uh, and up to the discretion of the school. Um, I, I think that taking out face to face is on the um, on the table. It implies either in person or video conferencing um, right now. Um, it depends on, you know, if the board decides to to take the second sentence. Um, in, in person and telehealth is also allowing the phone. Um, so we, and yeah, the face to face is kind of a secondary question to me to pick a pick a sentence or not. Or leave it silent, um, or, and then we need to discuss if face to face should come out or not. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, our next uh, comment. Our next comment comes from Marianne Callahan. Marianne, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Hi, thank you. That's Mariana Callahan, and I'm the clinical director at the Maple Counseling Center in the Los Angeles area. We're a training site, and um, you know, I'm just thinking about this uh, from the perspective of being the uh, the training site. We we have an incoming group of um, trainees that will be joining us in August that represent at least twelve different schools uh, or universities, and so I'm just. I don't have a solution to this, but I'm thinking about what might happen if each school has a different requirement in terms of our students must do this many hours in person and another school says, well, our students must do this many hours in person. And I think it could get a little bit chaotic in terms of how do we really effectively partner with with all of our university partners that we want to meet the expectations of and at the same time you know, run um, a center in an organized manner that um, allows us to serve the uh, clients in the best way possible and also meet the training needs. And, and one of the things that is missing for me in this, and I think because we don't know, is what are our clients going to want when we really do have a choice of in-person or telehealth? What if it turns out that, you know, 70% of our clients like telehealth and want to keep it, and they really don't want to come into the cling at all. And yet the schools require X number of hours for practicum in person, and then I'm left trying to figure out how to equitably divide up this small number of in-clinic clients who, you know, and again, we don't know. I might be completely wrong, but I just wanted to sort of suggest that when it, when we're coordinating all these different levels that that we sort of take into account all the different um, possibilities of how it's going to play out. And, and to also just mention that um, I think Sierra Smith uh, mentioned earlier that uh, the sentence that says the school and the supervisor shall utilize uh, their discretion, um, we'd want to clarify, is it that they have to have that conversation together um, or could it be done separately? And if it says that they would have their discretion to incorporate a mix, does that mean there must be a mix? Or is there the option to have it be all one or all the other? Because if it must be a mix, then there has to be something a little more specific, I think. Thank you. 
Very good. So, you know, so Mary, and I think that your, you know, the struggle is real and I actually, you know, my, my county, you know, I have actually, you know, I have conducted a survey and it's very interesting that, you know, the substance abuse client prefer more, you know, uh, online and our mental health client overwhelmingly actually prefer in person. So just a little shed, you know, example for, you know, for your reference. Of course, I live in, you know, Northern California, which is very different than Southern California. So there is that also, you know, that the big consideration, you know, that, you know, that when rural people don't have to fight the traffic and the parking slot and that kind of stuff, you know, so yes, it's, and, and this is exactly the challenge. And so, um, yeah, let's hear the next um, um, comments. Our next comment comes from Lily Vistica. Lily, your line is open and you'll have three minutes. Hi, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I'm an educator at a university training program and I'm hoping to gain clarification. If the waiver is not extended, um, will there be a gap between when these amendments would go into effect? Um, the reason I'm asking is that we do have a lot of site supervisors and students that currently cannot bring students back to full in person in our clinics because of social distancing and the space and some OSHA regulations. So I just wanted to know, I really wanna get clear guidance to provide to the students and the site supervisors. Um, I appreciate that where it's looking like these amendments will go. I think that gives us a lot more um, freedom to make, that, make those decisions. But if there, is there gonna be a, a, a point where we won't have the amendments done yet, but we will um, not have a waiver. So just trying to get clarification on that. And thank you very much for such thoughtful discussions on everything that has been discussed so far. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, move on to the next uh, comment. Next comment comes from Brittany Barger. Brittany, your line is open and you will have three minutes. Hi, this is Brittany Barger, LMFT and clinical supervisor at an agency. Um, I'd like to echo some of the comments made before um, one that I think the out of state licensing um, or practicing from out of state is, is a separate issue um, that there is already some law, law around and could be discussed at a later time. I think what I'm most concerned about right now is my trainees that I'm training right now who are seeing clients virtually. And that is the client's preference and it's what the clients want and it's part of our program right now. And what happens if all of a sudden these trainees can no longer see these folks, um, the client's preference is to be online. We don't have necessarily backup clinicians um, who could step in. So yeah, will there be some kind of time in order to make these adjustments? I mean, I hope that it will be a situation where it is continued, where both the schools and supervisors can make the decision um, if telehealth is appropriate, um, because I think I've seen really positive outcomes. And again, I'm also seeing a slant towards the clients actually making the decision that they wanna continue telehealth and they're maybe not opening to coming in person. Um, so, yeah, I think we're kind of missing that there's client preference involved in this as well. Um, in that many clients are deciding to um, seek out telehealth services. And yeah, right now I have a bunch of trainees who are seeing online clients. What would happen? And there would need to be some gap of time to have a um, ethical transfer of care if needed, um, if that were to be taken away. So just wanted to put in um, those thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next comment, please. Our next comment comes from Mary Reed. And again, just as a reminder, if we can keep our comments as concise as possible, as we are trying to be able to work through our full agenda and not leave any items off. Mary, your line is open. You will have three minutes. Thank you. And just wanted to thank everyone for their hard work on this extremely complex topic. Um, I'm putting in a little bit of a vote for the remain silent uh, and let it stay the language as it is uh, regarding face to face versus telehealth, um, partly because we don't know if we're going to have to shut down again if the virus worsens with the variants, et cetera. There may be students who are needing to graduate who have only had the opportunity to do telehealth. 
And I always think about wanting people to be able to graduate and then after graduation, you know, get jobs and, and be competent in the field for consumer protection, which is the BBS uh, mandate. So thinking, leave it as flexible as possible because we don't know what's going to happen. And yes, it does then tie into what if a student is in New York and they're doing their practicum remotely and, you know, all the state line issues, which would be a separate discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yes, our next comment comes from Myra Hernandez. And if I could just ask Marianne and Brittany to please lower your hands. Myra, you will have three minutes. Your line is open. Uh, thank you again for um, allowing me to speak. Um, again, um, I am a clinical director for our training facility through our, uh, the, our university here in the Central Valley. Um, and I also oversee placement sites um, as a lecturer in our um, department. So I do just want to say that um, allowing for as much flexibility in the language as a program and a training center, we already um, are diligent in the appropriateness of what clientele um, or what services we provide clients, whether it's telehealth or referring them out to in-person services. Um, so I think um, I just want to comment on that to just allow that flexibility for um, the, the, the program or the university or um, to determine the appropriateness um, of whether in person or telehealth and in terms of um, uh, trainees getting their hours. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? We do have one more that I will read and if I could remind Myra to lower her hand. Um, this comes from Asia Pham and she says, I graduated in May with my master's in clinical counseling MFT. I just wanted to share that as a trainee, I greatly benefited from the ability to be able to temporarily practice out of state. Due to being a military spouse, it allowed me to spend time with my husband who was stationed in Texas prior to his deployment this last November. Flexible regulation regarding out of state telehealth practices could tremendously benefit existing and future military spouses attending college in California. Thank you. So with that, that's our last comment. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I was moving a little faster. <laughs> so, you know, being said, you know, before we, you know, consider the motion, you know, I just really want to honor, you know, the kind of the, you know, the anxiety of the, you know, the, you know, the unknown about, you know, the, the waiver, because it just keep coming back up over and over again. And so I just really want to acknowledge it, you know, that, yes, you know, it's definitely, you know, we're marching into an unknown territory. And so we might have more more question, you know, and yet I, I also want to want to, you know, I know it's very hard, you know, for everybody, you know, which I myself included. So, you know, so I, at the same time, you know, I really want to direct, you know, the focus, you know, back on the uh, agenda items and so that we can go through them, you know, the, um, um, you know, the discussion. So let's go back to the board members. So now being, you know, we, we hear the comments. It's, you know, so, you know, I think we need to make a motion on, you know, choosing one or the other, you know, or the three, you know, the third, you know, option. And so, you know, I don't know which one seems like that's it's more favorable because it seems like, you know, the comments, you know, it's, you know, all over the place, but definitely one thing that I did hear is that, you know, that the um, in person, you know, it, it, you know, that is still not, you know, not an, a, a surface modality that um, will, you know, will go away, even though telehealth is taking more, you know, as a priority. So then really it's a question would be about like which, you know, language, you know, would address, you know, that, um, you know, the parameters that we set in, you know, or the clarification that we set in, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the the first motion really is about like, you know, more focusing on the face to face and then telehealth as, you know, a part of the, you know, component. And the other one, the second one that we talked about is actually, you know, leave it to the supervisor and or the school that may utilize, you know, their discussion to incorporate a mix of in person and telehealth, which means that the second one, you know, it, you know, it doesn't really put any emphasis on one way or the other. So, you know, and then, of course, you know, then completely take away the face to face is completely open. So we have like 3 different options, you know, that we can look at, you know, yes, Roseanne. I would throw in 1 more option based on what I heard is just leave it at the status quo and not amend. Um, 
assuming face to face means um, is is in person or video, basically. Now, my question is that because, you know, if we, the fourth option, you know, has already, you know, causing a lot of the question. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we could clarify and say, um, you know, in person or telehealth or in person and, or video. Right, right. Yes. So my my thinking is that, you know, I, you know, after hearing everybody, you know, I'm still thinking that, um, you know, probably the second option, you know, that, you know, that uh, the school and or the supervisor, you know, may utilize the discretion to incorporate a mix of in person and telehealth. So since it's talking about a mix. So, you know, the in person element is there, it's clarified, it doesn't have a little quantifier, you know, how many hours. So, I would actually, you know, you know, um, suggest that. Board members? I, I agree, Christina. I think that that's probably the best option. It gives flexibility um, and, it, and it still allows, or, or sorry, the words aren't coming out right now. I agree with the second one, Christina. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with the second one too because it does retain the flexibility. Right. So, Roseanne, now in that sense, we would definitely need your help, you know, to craft, you know, to to you know to say the motion. Okay. Um, so one more question though, do you want with that sentence, um, the school and or student or, or the supervisor may utilize their discretion to incorporate a mix of in-person and telehealth experience. Should we delete um, further up above where it says a minimum of 150 hours of face-to-face? -face? Really, Tele good. really good question. I don't think you need it any. No. So. I want to see, okay, so what is the requirement now? Because now that is the example of the LMFT, right? And, um, you know, it, does the LPCC has a different one? No, because the, the LPCC, LPCC is the same except for it's 280 hours. So it would, it would be the same language for LPCC. Um, and I think with that language, we could still use it. Um, we could still use it for the out-of-state. I don't think it would hurt anything for the out-of-state either. Right, right, right. Because it's just suggestive, it's not prescriptive. Right. Um, now, because I also see that, you know, now, do you know, in, do you have, put in this way, maybe put in this way. My suggestion is that let's leave that 50, 150 hours in for now, because I feel like that, you know, you know, because no, we, we it, yeah, go ahead. That, sorry, the 150 hours isn't the question that has to stay. It's the word face to face because the word face to face kind of conflicts with telehealth um, because telehealth is not necessarily face to face. It's a number of different modalities. Right. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you. I was more thinking about like, is it like that the whole chunk, you know, whether we're taking away? No, no, no. The, the 150 hours is not on the table. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Right. That's ex <laughs> it's the face to face. Right. Yeah. It's the word face to face. Right, right. Sorry, I said that made that more clear. Uh, I would like to hear from the board members. Chris, what do you think? So the word now it's about interpretation of of the term face to face, whether that constitutes person versus versus video conferencing. Yes, are you right? Right. It's in, in person. Face to face implies in person or video conferencing. Um, Telehealth is described is defined as a number of different modalities. It could be via right. telephone. It could be via um, text. Right. Okay. I I kind of lean toward the face. You know, if we're saying it's telehealth is okay, then then we don't need face to face unless yeah. you're like yeah. If if we're going to, I mean, yeah, I, I I can see that. So so it 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 opens up the options for how clients are seen by trainings, right? Yes. Okay. okay, no, I. you know what? I need to get off of this whole, like we have to do in-person thing because that's just not what the world is anymore. I, I believe in the deepest part of my soul as a, as a mental health provider that there still needs to be like human face-to-face -face contact. 
but I don't, you know, that, then I become a dinosaur. So, you know, I have to, we have to, we have to, I have to move into the 21st century. It is the 21st century, right? Okay. It is. Just, it's tough. I mean, and we can always, you know, revisit. We're going to look at this a couple more times. We're going to look at it at the next meeting, which we have to set a date for the next meeting. We're going to look at it at policy and advocacy, and then we're going to look at it at board. Okay. Um, so. Yeah. Then, then, yeah, then let's, uh, I, then I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. I think it's a, if it's going to help streamline things and move it along, yeah. Without, with, of course, while still protecting, you know, consumer. So my thought is also similar, you know, my thought is that telehealth, okay, it's just video conferencing, but, you know, but, and I thought like face-to-face, -face, you know, the in-person and that telehealth would be like, a, you know, a specifier, but now obviously it is not because it also have the element of conflicting. So I'm okay to take out the face-to-face. You know, instead of the hunt, <laughs> yeah. So, so in that sense, what would be Roseanne the renewed language? You know, so the renewed language would be, and this would be for, for j just LMFT and LPCC, um, the the current education. So it would not be for the old degree program. It would be for the current ex current people in school, and out of state applicants for LMFT and LPCC. The language would read something like. Now, this is, I'm reading the MFT language, but we'll draft it for all and bring it back. It would be a minimum of 150 hours of experience counseling individuals, couples, families, or groups. And then it would say the school and, and or the supervisor may utilize their discretion to incorporate a mix of in-person and telehealth experience. Yes. Okay. Susan, are you making a motion? I make a motion. That what Roseanne just said is our motion. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Do I have a second? And this is Sabina. I want to remind you that this is a rec our, or motion is a recommendation because we are a committee also. I just wanted to add that in, make yes. sure it gets into our motion. Yes. We're not recommending to the PNA meeting. No. <laughs> We're recommending that you know basically stay with this committee right now. Yes, I'll, I'll second the the motion to recommend. Yes. Okay. So one last time, public comments. Anything relating to this particular motion? Or oh, we're done. Sabina, what do they? We need to open it. Yeah. Yes, but uh, just a reminder: it is specifically only on the motion on the table for our public comment during this period. So the motion that was just stated, we'll take public comments on, I believe, and then we'll go ahead with our vote so we can move on. Yes. So, moderator, our Q and A feature is open, and the hand raise feature is also available. If anybody has one final comment on this motion specifically. We have a request from Marianne Kellett. Marianne, your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I'm clear on this now, because I believe that the way uh, Roseanne read it, that what you have done now is by taking out face-to-face -face and opening it as an option for things to be in-person or telehealth, that that does open up the possibility that all of the services could be provided over telephone, because that is part of telehealth. And I don't know if I'm hearing that correctly or not, but by removing the words face to face and not using video conferencing. That, anyhow, that's yes. that's my question. That is what it does. That is correct. OK, thank you. So another clarification, I think that the, um, the language is in a corporate a mix of in person and telehealth. So we're not dropping in person. And no, we're not dropping in person. We're right. we're allowing telehealth in everything that's defined by telehealth in Business and Professions yes. Code twenty two ninety point five. Um, if it fits that definition, it is it is acceptable at the school and the supervisor and or the supervisor's discretion. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, um, moderator, any mm -hmm. other person? And if I can remind Marianne to lower her hand, our next and final comment is from Stuart Lee. 
And he says, thank you. The proposed wording would be so helpful in clarifying for our student trainees. Thank you so much. Good to hear that we're speaking, you know, representing the public. Awesome. So, Christina, I think we're ready to vote. And I'll take that roll call, but I need to get that motion again. I didn't, I got some words thrown in and out and I just wanted to get a solid motion. So the motion would be um, to recommend um, staff to pursue an amendment to um, 4980.36. 4980.78, 4999.33, and 4999.62 that reads generally, um, and this is not, the hours requirements is not all the same, the wording isn't exactly, but we're going to amend the language to say a minimum of X number of hours, whatever is required. Um, experience counseling individ individuals, couples, families, or groups. The school and or the supervisor may utilize their discretion to incorporate a mix of in person and telehealth experience. Okay, thank you. And I will take a roll call. Uh, Susan Friedman. Yes. Chris Jones. Christina Wong. Yes. Motion carries. All right, thank you so much, Christina. So let's um, move on to our next agenda item, and that is. We still aren't finished. We haven't still haven't done attachment C. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought we're done with that. Oh, that's right. Okay, Roseanne, go take it away. Okay, so really quickly, this should be pretty straightforward. Um, clarification for LCSW experience hours, and we're talking about here. We're talking about LCSWs in the cons in, in the concept of we're talking about associate clinical social workers. We're not talking about people in school anymore. We're talking about people that are registered, but they also have a term face to face in their in their law that is causing confusion and it kind of best lines up with this particular topic that we're talking about here. So um, if you look at page 21 and attachment, which is attachment C, um, ASWs are required by law to have at least of their 2000 required in in, a, in clinic in person. Or, sorry. Of their minimum 2000 hours in clinical in clinical services, um, they're required to have at least 70, 750 hours of face to face individual or group psychotherapy provided in the context of clinical social work services. That is providing that's causing confusion um, because people want to know if um, face to face can be via telehealth. Um, it implies tele it implies in person or video conferencing. Um, I don't think when this particular sentence was written that it was meant that it's really meant that the word face to face, I don't think is really the key word here. I think that what they're what the law is trying to do here is make sure at least 750 hours um, are individual group therapy in the context of clinical social work services. I think that word is the kicker there. Um, I don't think the face to face is really all that significant and that it was meant to um, be video conferencing or in person or something. I think that the term face to face has can be deleted. Um, so that's what I am proposing. So, so that's I, yeah. So my suggestion, actually, you know, be being in line, with, you know, with all the other, you know, uh, license type. My suggestion is actually to, in, you know, delete the face to face, and yet, you know, add that language of. Um, in person and or telehealth experience um, by individual or from individual or group ther therapy. So, you know, so that we can actually, you know, be very consistent. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Chris or um, Susan? Not? Yes. Yeah. I think that's good. Consistency is okay. important. Yes, you know, just consistent and, you know, become like the, the you know, a good clarification. Um, so let's see, you know, I want to speed it up. And, and so I would actually let me make a motion, you know, and then talk about, you know, open up for the public so that, you know, we can make it, you know, really quick. So the motion would be, you know, for that. Um, well, actually, I will have Roseanne to. Actually, okay. So, I don't think in this particular case, 
I'm reading the, the log in and trying to think how we will put in person and or. Um, the way the hours are because because we're clarifying that ASWs can provide services either in person or via telehealth. Um, we don't specify that for all of the other hours. I don't think it needs to be specified for I don't think the in person and or telehealth needs to be specified there. You see what I'm saying? Well, so okay. It's because because the, when we talk about the seventeen hundred hours under experience of a, a social worker, we're talking about the three thousand hours at the very top under A. Um, I don't because we don't specify how how any of those other hours are. It, they can all be in person or via telehealth. Right. So I don't. I think that if we said that for for this particular thing. So we would need to say that for all. So it means that, you know, that, you know, now if you delete that face to face, also there might be, you know, that, you know, again, you know, raising the question, you know, that's, um, I mean, you know, by taking it away, it just becomes like wide open, you know, that they can actually do all, you know, telehealth and all in person. You know, right. I think the whole, you know, the, I, 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 you know, I think the whole point is that we want to clarify that it's not just one modality, you know, especially, you know, the, the importance of still, you know, having the in-person. Okay. So, yeah, so whatever the language is gonna, I mean, you know, maybe it's about like, um, so maybe, um, yes. I yeah I we probably need to think a little bit more about that then because so when we're talking about trainees there's more of a question right but but the law since the law already allows so the law allows associates to perform services via telehealth I don't yeah I you know what I'm thinking. thinking considering, you know, the, you know, because, you know, we don't want to just take it out of one segment, mm -hmm. you know, and then change and then affect the whole entirety, you know, of the practice law. So maybe, you know, the good way is just, we can just table this one until next, okay. next time. And, have, you know, and Roseanne, just, you know, just read through it and just making sure that, you know, it's sure. even pertinent, you know, to discuss it because right now I'm not sure if there's any a lot of the question and problem you know arise okay. from this face to face so maybe leaving it as it is is actually a wonderful thing okay yeah that works too okay okay so we really can move forward now <laughs> so let's go let's move forward to num item num item number eight which is the supervision buyer teleconferencing so Roseanne please Christina okay. just be just before we start um, I'm sorry, but member uh, member Friedman has to actually leave at 12:15, so she will be leaving. So just wanted to announce that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So discussing possible amendments of allowance of supervision via video conferencing. So this is a continuation of our March 26th discussion, um, and it focuses on whether supervision via video conferencing should continue to be allowed only in exempt settings, or if should, it should also be allowed in other settings. Um, also, clarifying face to face contact as it pertains to interaction with one's supervisor needs to be discussed. Um, so, current law only permits associates to be supervised via video conferencing if they are working in an exempt setting. Um, and the term working probably needs to be clarified as well. An exempt setting is a government entity, a school, college, university, or an institution that's nonprofit and charitable. In addition, right now, the law only explicitly permits associates working in an, a setting to obtain supervision via video in an exempt setting to obtain supervision via video conferencing. Um, the board is currently pursuing an amendment right now via AB 690 that it discussed um, several months back that would change the law to instead in, permit supervisees working in an exempt setting to obtain supervision via video conferencing. So um, that would clarify the law that all supervisees not which includes trainees can have it as well if it's an exempt setting. But the COVID-19 state of emergency, of course, is, has, has um, 
raised all these questions about supervision via video conference. So the committee might wish to discuss number one, whether supervision via video conferencing should be continued to allow be allowed only in exempt settings or permitted in some to some degree in other setting types. And it should discuss whether trainees in exempt settings should be subject to any limits of the amount of supervision via video conferencing they can obtain just because they are the newest practitioners. Um, we would also need a clarification of face to face contact and supervision to go along with this right now. Um, supervision is defined as an hour of face to face contract contact between a number of supervisees and their supervisor. Um, so we need to discuss that I've included and I won't go through them in the interest of time. Um, what other states do via video conferencing? Um, there some have a mix. They're kind of all over the place. A lot of them have a mix of 50% allowance. Some allow all, some allow none. A lot of them are looking at the law like we are. Um, one thing I didn't see is we make an ex uh, exemption based on setting. If it's an exempt setting, I'm not seeing other states doing that really. Um, so moving on to the proposed language that's shown in attachment A. Um, there is a number of issues with this proposed and with, you know, the need to be discussed as part of this proposed language. It's a very complicated topic at this point. I don't think we're going to get through it today. Um, but um, the proposal would clarify the meaning of face to face contact. It proposes allowing as written, it would propose allowing, but limiting the amount of supervision via video conference in non exempt settings. Um, the, the committee, I really want to emphasize to the committee and stakeholders to keep in mind that that allowing supervision via video conferencing un, unlimited has implications for allowing out of state practice right now video the video conferencing prohibition in non exempt settings ensures that an associate working in private practice is not working remotely an associate could if they were allowed to um, have all remote supervision and I'm not saying this is bad or good but an associate located in another state would legally be allowed to do all of their hours via telehealth and never meet with a supervisor in person um, if if it was 100% allowed. So maybe that's okay, maybe that's not, but that would be something that would be permitted. Um, we get lots of, of, you know, there's lots of corporations out there that um, would, you know, like to provide the option for all video conferencing and all um, supervision via video conferencing. So it's up to the board to sort of weigh the public protection implications of that. Um, the committee should also discuss if the allowance of supervision via video conference in exempt settings is appropriate for trainees or for just associates, like a AB 690 is proposing, uh, if that's okay long term. Um, and the committee should also discuss um, cleaning up the use of the term working in an exempt setting if we're going to keep the exempt setting um, allowance. So um, there's a number of things to discuss. I'll open it up. I don't expect that we'll necessarily get to this today. We'll probably need to bring it back to the next meeting. And at some point I recommend um, cutting off the discussion before the meeting ends because we need to get to the survey questions too. Right. So in that sense, I'm going to make the very, very bold move. <laughs> so I'm going to propose you know, I mean, I, I broke down several, several, um, you know, uh, elements. So I propose that um, that video conferencing supervision, you know, be applied to all, to every different setting. So we can clean this up so that business corp, you know, corporation will have the same um, benefits, you know, just like um, exam setting. Now, the other thing is about the in-person versus teleconferencing. My proposal is to have, say, you know, so 50%, half and half. So while 50% of the um, in person, you know, 50% of the supervision will, will need to be in person and 50%, you know, will be via teleconferencing. And, um, and then also, you know, I think we can also put another specifier, which is to have those in person. You know, you know, say like, you know, it will be in person and the teleconferencing would be within the same month. You know, so that means that, you know, it will be two, two weeks or alternatively week, you know, so basically it's 50%, you know, that will occur by month uh, by on a week on a monthly basis. 
And then also I would say, you know, the trainee, you know, will allow, you know, teleconferencing, you know, as an option for uh, the trainees. So that's actually my very bold <laughs> recommendation <laughs> and actually kind of like a motion, but not motion, but that's my idea. So, you know, so I would like to kind of like maybe use that as a, as a, you know, foundation, you know, to talk about that. So, Chris, what do you think? I agree there needs to be a balance uh, between in person uh, or in, in person supervision and, um, you know, tele supervision or, or whatever you want to call it video supervision. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't know if with regards to the timing of it, like if there needs to be, it needs to be, um, I, I'm not sure that I fully understood that, Christina, what you meant, like, like when you do supervision. Um, if you're doing it X four times a month, two of them need to be in person and two of them need to be, it could, can be tele, is that what you were, that's okay. Um, I don't, I don't know if I, if I, if I would, I think that could, I think that could be hammered out. Um, but I, I do, I do agree that, that there needs to be a balance between the in-person. Um, I don't think it all should be tele or supervision. There, there's a lot that happens in the room, you know? Um, especially when someone who, who's learning um, that 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 we need to address. Um, I, I'm not opposed to 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 your suggestion at all. I think it's I think it's okay. I, I think again, um, you know, I, I I would agree with it. I would just I'd like to hear what other um, you know supervisors are are um, are going through. I know with my own supervision when I'm when I'm working with um, with interns. Um, it's it's a lot different when they're in the room versus when they're not. So I, I think yes. there's there's a piece of that that still needs to continue. So and I totally agree. So let me explain why, you know, I have the thoughts, you know, to specify in a monthly basis. You know, because when you think about, you know, the, the process of um, um, supervising a, a you know an, an associate, you know, it will take about two years, you know, to three years, you know, before they completely acquire. You know the experience and so you know so you know to to really protect the public and to prevent you know the out of state you know supervisor you know who hold the license you know california license and for example residing in new york you know and then supervising you know the uh you know the the um um the in the associates in california Right, so that's, you know, that's why, you know, that, you know, if you don't put that, you know, the specifier there, you know, they can easily just do one supervisor for in person and then or this, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the other supervisor, you know, just be, a, be able to do the teleconferencing and that person can be out of state. So I think, you know, uh, think about this, right, you know, so, you know. So I think that's that's just you know a little loophole, interesting loophole that you know when I was thinking about that, you know, we really need to, you know, kind of like have a little more thoughtful process so that you know we can address that. You know, how can we make sure that we're not, you know, also we're we're making sure that the quality, you know, of the supervision stay consistent, not because of having, you know, that um the the, the flexibility of the teleconferencing, you know, so that it can be compromised. So that's that's my thought. But I'm open for discussions. So well, no, so can I just ask yeah. a clarifying question? So in, in your scenario, when you're thinking about the loopholes that people are going to try to find to get around things, right? That where you're talking about uh, someone that would have multiple supervisors, like if someone's out of state, they would they would they would do the telehealth with or the tele supervision with someone who's out of state versus someone who's in state, and then now we're getting convoluted. Okay. Yes. That that's okay. Then yeah, right. Then you're losing consistency and practice, and and then that that results in poor training, and then then we're we're opening up a bigger problem. Right. Okay. No, I I'm on board with that. Okay. So Steve, you know, you have something to say? Yeah. It's just a, I look at those, and you know, I'm I'm one for opening up. But when I'm looking at these subjects, I'm really looking at consumer. I mean, consumer protection is a big thing, but we really haven't figured out if if there's really a if you know online video conferencing supervision is really going to make a is really going to protect the consumer if we just do face to face. I don't know what's better. Um, so I mean, 50-50 sounds like a good split. 
Administratively, though, I don't want to make it difficult on supervisors because we definitely need more supervisors out there. So um, making it a little bit more, not to make light of the, the proposal, but convoluted as in during this period, you have to have a certain amount of hours. I don't know, first of all, how our staff is really going to, you know, evaluate that completely. I mean, and it's going to put a burden on the on the actual supervisor themselves. Um, I think at a point we really just have to be able to trust that we are going to have, you know, supervisors that are committed to supervising appropriately. Um, and if they're not, we probably will get wind of that eventually. Or the the actual person who's being, you know, supervised may not pass the exam because they don't know. Um, so there's there's kind of a mechanism for that. So I mean, my only suggestion is I would probably not try to add in additional components to that other than 50 50. Um, I'm not sure what value it would add other than making people put something different on a sheet. Um, whether they're doing it or not, I don't know either. I mean, honestly, so it's really gets down to a trust factor, although it does. I understand it would make them think more about face to face and we're all assuming, and that's true, that you know that everyone's going to do video conferencing and stuff. But if I'm a good supervisor, I'm going to be looking at maybe this, you know, this trainee or this associate really does need to have face-to-face -face training. So we're not going to do video conferencing. You're going to have to come on in. So it's still up to them, the supervisor, to decide. You know, is it appropriate? And that's what we have to. That's what I'm banking on. Is hopefully that supervisor will really say, is this really appropriate? Maybe that associate, for some weird, some reason, is able to express themselves better over a video conferencing. There's some people that, you know, being inside with their supervisor, maybe they won't be able to express stuff as much. And over online, I mean, that's the other. Honestly, yes, I see the face-to-face -face component definitely different, but there are some students, associates, or whatever that might actually be better through video conferencing, too. So, so microphone. I am going to make a suggestion to change my own own the recommendation, which is to, you know, the 50-50 and the video conference conferencing and in person remain the same, but it will be per supervisor instead of take out the time. So when we put the per supervisor in, you know, it guarantees that, you know, that is not going to be like, you know, it's not going to be all by somebody who is, you know, outside doing just, you know, the um you know, the video conferencing. So, which means that, you know, all supervisor will be, we we'll have to, you know, we we'll have to really basically check that, you know, ourselves, you know, certify that this is like, you know, the video conferencing and, you know, and uh, the proportion, you know, is half and half. Or they can do, you know, all, um, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, and quick suggestion I saw, I forget what state it was, but I kind of like that model too, is that they had a component where, you had to have a certain amount of initial in-person training or conference and supervision uh, initially before you were able to begin video conferencing, video supervising with that person. I think if we're going to propose something like that, I could see saying, you know, your initial contact with that supervisor needs to be so and so hours worth of supervision before you can begin video conferencing. Right. I mean, that might be appropriate. Uh, uh, just a suggestion. I think that's, um, you know, fifth, you know, just because all the st states, you know, it's just so all over the board. And so I think the, um, you know, 50 50 is actually a really good compromise, you know, and I think, you know, if we put that, um, you know, that basically, like you say, you know, it's up to the, the supervisor's discretion, you know, how that portion of the in person is going to implement, you know, we just leave it open. I think that would probably, you know, resolve, you know, the, uh, you know, not to be too stringent, but at the same time, you know, allow the flexibility, cons consumer protection, and also, you know, mental health, um, you know, competency. So, uh, so that's my motion. <laughs> actually, you know, not not a mo that's my motion. You know, that's my actually suggestion. So, um, let's see. You know, I really want to speed it up. So, what should I do, Sabina? So, should I just kind of like make it as a motion? You know, and then we open up for the public comments and, you know, what do you think? That's correct. So let's have our, um, let's make sure our motion is clear for our minutes. 
and um, and then we'll have our second and then we'll open for public comment. Okay. So, you know, so Roseanne, do, so do you, do you have what I have? The yes. Device? So I think the motion would be um, to draft amendments that would make video conference supervision applied to all settings, um, but do a 50 50 split in person vi um, video conference per supervisor. And then also the training, you know, it's allowed the training to. Um, yeah, so we're already, um, we're already, let's see, we are allowing, we're, um, well, I think it would include training, but I will make sure that it includes that. It says supervising, so it, yeah, it includes training. We right. will be, I mean, it will be, there will be a little bit of, of, of so we are expanding the supervision to um, trainees right now in exempt settings via video conferencing. So it will be a little bit of an adjustment for that group because they'll be able to do it for about a year. And then if this went through as, then it would be, then it would go to 50% only. So because of COVID and the way that things changed when we were changing the law, there's gonna be a little bit of weirdness there. But, um, but I think that, that that's the motion that we're discussing for long-term. Right. Okay. okay. So that's it. That's my motion. And Chris, I need a second. <laughs> Thank you. So at this point, let's open up for the public comments, really specifically relating to this, um, you know, this motion, and so that we can speed it up and get through the agenda. So. Thank you very much. So, moderator, please open the Q and A panel. This is the moderator. We've opened the Q and A panel. The hand raise feature is also enabled for your use to request public comment. Uh, for this public comment round, we we will be limiting comments to one minute. And just as a reminder, um, if you're not able to submit your whole comment in that minute, you can always submit your comments to the board via email. Our first comment comes from. Farah Zarehi, and just as a reminder, if you can please keep your comments brief and to the point of the motion that's been made. Farah, your line is open. You will have one minute. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for the flexibility that the board is displaying here and for the opportunity to speak. I do want to push back against the 50-50. I know the concern is to protect the public, but I think that we have to have faith that our supervisors are doing appropriate work and not providing supervision in a setting where they think is inappropriate. So for example, if a clinician they feel is not you know, taking it seriously or maybe not disclosing stuff because it's telehealth, that supervisor would then make the choice to, to say, I'm only going to do this in person. Um, I want to just remind the board that there are many, many, many clinicians that are kind of facing a really tough decision of being in their practice setting, being established, and then, you know, don't necessarily have the opportunity to um, see their supervisors in person because of the pandemic. So I think that if we offer a mo even more flexible flexible option, then that's gonna only benefit our um, clinicians and ultimately the public as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Ben Caldwell. Ben, you will have one minute. Your line is open. Thank you very much. I agree with the prior comment. I um, appreciate the desire for balance here. And I'm also, really wary of setting policy by uh, essentially pulling numbers out of thin air. Um, this would be a significant new restriction on supervision for those nonprofits and other exempt settings who even pre-pandemic under existing law have been providing supervision uh, meaningfully by a video conference. Um, and, and I think this needs more time to consider all of the use cases and impacts that would be involved. I'd be especially curious to hear what uh, what language Jen and the folks from camp might uh, might prefer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you, Ben. And I'll oh, stand by. Try to switch myself over to one computer so I could open the WebEx for the other meeting and it's not cooperating. So let me go back. Okay, and our next comment comes from Heather Jans, 
Heather, your line is open. You will have one minute. Hi, thank you so much for having me again. I, I wanted to share that um, although I, I know that you're trying to protect the consumer, we might be limiting again access to be able to provide enough care to all rural areas. Uh, I think it's really important that um, although you're saying you want to uh, make sure that they, the employee resides in California, everyone should be registered in California, abiding by the California laws of the BBS. Um, if they're li if they're living out of state, they need to also respect those state laws and, and people understand that. Um, as a, a supervisor, I think we should be able to say whether or not we have the capability of uh, assessing that associate. Um, I know for me, I'm very good at using Zoom and breakout rooms and scheduling extra time with my employees and associates. Uh, to be able to um, provide good care. Um, so leaving it up to the supervisors would be very helpful. Um, and I, I just don't see why you would uh, discriminate between non-exempt and exempt settings here because all consumers are have expired. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Marianne Callahan. Marianne, your line is open. You will have one minute. Yes, hi. Um, so uh, we are a training site, as I mentioned earlier, and um, to me, one of the beauties of not having a restriction on the video supervision is that it allows me to really uh, hire and recruit the best supervisors that are out there. And in my mind, it's a very clear line between good supervision to the trainees leads to good client care. Um, if we need to impose a restriction on exempt settings that all of the supervisors that supervise for us must be in the office 50% of the time, you have dramatically limited the pool of uh, people that I could hire because 15 a 50% time doesn't give me any more advantage than saying 100% time um, in terms of being able to hire people that might be further afield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Brittany Barger. And if I can again remind you once you've completed your comment to lower your hand. Brittany, your line is open. You will have one minute. Thank you so much for the time again. Again, I'm a clinical supervisor in exempt setting currently supervising both trainees and associates. I also agree with removing the 50-50 language. Um, I think again, piggybacking on other comments that giving it up to supervisor discretion is necessary. I have requested from student, certain trainees or associates if they need extra time to be able to meet with them, but some of my trainees and associates live over an hour away and to have them come in is just not practical, especially since the world is moving to uh, a lot of video conferencing therapy. Um, so I also am in agreement with disposing of the 50-50 language and using, uh, leaving it up to supervisor discretion in those cases. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our Thank next you. Our next comment. comment comes from Sierra Smith. Okay, her on our list. Sierra, your line is open. You'll have one minute. Hi, I wanted to uh, say that I agree with all of my colleagues prior to this. I also want to point out that as an organization that values diversity, we have had a number of clinicians and a few supervisors who have various disabilities, including blindness, use of wheelchairs and such, where requiring 50-50 supervision and sort of the discrepancy between whether something's in person versus um, vi uh, video conferencing you know, depending on your level of visual impairment, sometimes that may not make a difference. So requiring that in person, also relying on access. If you're familiar with Los Angeles, we have public access for people who need the transportation with the disability, and that can be very unreliable and at times has been challenging that we try to accommodate, whereas telehealth, telesupervision has been very helpful in saving those clinicians time getting to the center because they're not reliant on the public system of support. So please, if you, I hope you don't move in this direction, but if you do, please make some allowances for people with disabilities to get exemption from it. Thank you. Our next comment comes from Jen Alley. Jen, your line is open. You will have one minute. 
Uh, thank you. Hello, Jennifer Alley with Camp. Um, you know, prior to the conversation um, with the 50-50 split that was recommended um, during the discussion, you know, we had some, you know, serious consumer protection concerns about the lack of oversight in an exempt setting. Um, you know, we would have an associate providing telehealth services in isolation, you know, without face-to-face -face supervision. And so, you know, the potential for a real patient protection issue, I think, is there. And again, I think that the survey responses, um, and, you know, an analysis, is, an analysis of those to determine what really happened in 2020 would be extremely helpful in deliberating this issue. Um, I also think that the spreadsheet that um, Roseanne provided provides some good examples, and that coupled with our survey could really give us a, a good approach on which direction we should go. Um, as to restricting what is currently available um, in some settings, you know, in training sites, I mean, I think that that's a problem, and there's been a difference in the settings, um, rules, and requirements because they are different. And I don't think, um, you know, necessarily that one size fits all when we, we're talking about training and supervision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. Thank you. And if I can, please remind Heather, Sierra, and Jen to please lower your hands. Our next comment comes from Julie Cohen. Julie, your line is open. You will have one minute. Um, thank, thank you for letting me speak. Um, I want to also agree with my colleagues that have spoken. Um, I have been supervising since 1998, and I have supervised in every possible setting, primarily community mental health. And this last year, with all the troubles, I think that being able to do supervision um, via telehealth has been like game changing for me in a number of ways. Um, I, I honestly do not see any significant difference. There are differences, but I don't see significant differences in doing supervision face to face versus telehealth. Um, I, I've been doing, uh, you know, this for the last year. Seconds. And, um, you know, the other thing, a, a colleague pointed out something called the great resignation. And I don't know if you're familiar with that term. I didn't know it regarding all of the fleeing from mental, the mental health field um, and the difficulty it is to hire supervisors and clinicians. Time has expired. Our next comment comes from Myra Hernandez. Myra, your line is open. You will have one minute. Thank you again. Again, I I, I, I want to agree with everybody who's been speaking. Putting that 50-50 limitation on, on everyone is, is just uh, honestly upsetting if, as a recommendation. Um, as a nonprofit in our Central Valley, we already have a shortage of supervisors. And so if you put that limitation, it's going to really reduce who we can hire and and even you know having that the, the client care that is so forth needs that supervision so i just wanted to say that um, i think you should leave it up to the supervisor to make it a um, their assessment of what it's appropriate um, for that particular trainee or associate thank you the next uh, comment please next comments from stuart lee i will read his comment he says, MFT trainees in exempt settings can continue to receive supervision via real-time video conferencing even after the waiver expires at the end of this month, correct? That's a question. And then he says he echoes Ben Caldwell's concern about 50-50. Okay. Uh, the next comment after that comes from, let's find it. Oh my gosh, it jumped around on me, stand by. Uh, Dominique Fragoso and the comment submitted says the date for telehealth supervision ends at the end of this month. Will it be extended until further notice? And then the next comment comes from Susie Hughes, who says like, oh, she says she can't raise her hand. Are we assuming that all interns are at the primary place of business? All telehealth should occur in the office. So that is her comment. And our last hand raised comment comes from Tara Hodgins. And if Myra, if I could please remind you to lower your hand. Tara, your line is open. You will have one minute. 
Hi there, uh, Tara Hodgins, YMCA Youth and Family Services. I just want to um, echo what uh, my fellow colleagues have been saying about the 50 50. Um, we've hopefully learned from this pandemic that we don't want people coming into work feeling sick, whether or not that's they have allergies or, or whatever's happening. We just don't want to be forcing people now to feel like they have to come in person. Um, because now there's a new requirement. I feel like that's one of the lessons we've learned from this pandemic is, is having that work flexibility and having people feel like um, if they're not well, they can stay home. And I think having a 50-50 stipulation just would kind of go back to the other way of, of um, how we previously did things pre-pandemic. Thank you. Okay, any more? Um, Tara, if I could remind you to lower your hand, and with that, that concludes our request for comment. Thank you very much. So I want to just really, again, you know, echo, you know, the, you know, the, the you know, the, the challenge of adjusting to, you know, the teleconferencing, you know, and, and I, I have to say that, you know, I also have a hard time because, we, you know, when the employer said you need to go back to work, you know, there are all these questions raised and how do you do that? We get used to one way and now, you know, are we going to, you know, going back to, you know, the old way when we find out that this, you know, pandemic way that we got get accustomed to, you know, it's so convenient. So, you know, so it's certainly, you know, I totally understand, you know, the, at the same time, you know, I think the most important thing is like, we do need to, you know, consider, you know, in the longer term, you know, what really are the standard? And also, you know, how do we, you know, really protect the consumer? You know, so, you know, so I think this is, um, you know, a very important thing that we need to bear in mind, you know, as the board, you know, to set these standards, you know, not to really inconvenient, in, inconvenient people. And especially we know now that, you know, we do have a taste of how this is, you know, this is what is going on and how teleconferencing is easier, you know, to do supervision. And so, you know, so I would say that, you know, that uh, Roseanne, you know, maybe put in this way, um, not to Roseanne first, but Chris, you know, now, you know, you heard, you know, also, you know, the public comments, you know, that what do you think that, um, you know, you know, any feedback from you in general? They don't seem to like the, uh, the, the proposal very much, Christine. <laughs> Oh, I, know. Yes. I, I think that I yes. think that what what I want the takeaway for me from from the public comment is that we we need more we need more information, and so maybe um, maybe we need to you know when we talk about but you know, before we we vote on or make this decision, get some data to 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 talk about the effectiveness of of uh, video supervision versus in person supervision. Um, you know, to to really see if there is a if there's if there's a difference. You know, we have a lot of anecdotal data. I I tend to be on the same page with you that that it's just different, and I and it's I feel it's more effective. But what my feelings are isn't you know isn't isn't data. It, it's it's simply anecdotal information. Um, so if there's a way when we're putting this survey together to um, you know put questions in there that would help us get a better determination of the effectiveness of both. And, um, you know, whether there's a need to do the split, I think that that would help us make a better decision. That's absolutely true. So, and that, and I think this is exactly why that, um, you know, that spreadsheet, you know, coming from ASWB, you know, and, you know, what we acquire is so helpful. And so I also want to remind everybody too, you know, now I'm, I'm ultimately it's, you know, I'm making a recommendation, but I think also that, you know, the fact is that, you know, this is a very wide open field and a lot of the states have already, you know, had the, you know, restriction, you know, and, you know, and so we have to really think about, you know, not just about, you know, our, you know, our, our convenience or inconvenience, we really have to, you know, talk about the quality because, you know, we already, you know, the theme that keep coming up, definitely, you know, it's about like, you know, their limitation, 
there's a limitation about, you know, about supervision, you know, over video conferencing, because there's many things that missed, you know, even, you know, in the parallel counseling cannot be all replaced, you know, necessarily by, by telehealth, because there's something that is missed. And so I think they're, you know, in the process, when we look at the essence of the supervision, you know, it's very important that, you know, that the supervisor are able to, you know, to, you know, address, you know, the full blown, you know, so that, you know, that's a, you know, the very important part about the transference, counter transference and all these discussion will need to be, you know, we need to be done. So we have to be reminded that, you know, that how do we accomplish it? Can video conferencing really be able to just do all of them? When both Chris, me, you know, Ben, you know, all everybody realized that, oh my God, our perceived notion about the person is different, you know, whether it's about like the implicit bias that Dr. Darling talked about. I think this is all relevant thing. And so, you know, so I would say that, you know, Roseanne, now maybe, you know, the, it looks like the, you know, the direction, you know, is to really look at, at the, um, the survey. And so what do you think about like, you know, that uh, maybe we can move on to the next topic? And just really kind of like get get it very quick, you know, because I think you know to survey is, you know becomes another gateway, and so yes, Sabina, I agree. Um, I think it's too early to make any sort of recommendation or determination <laughs> about this language. Um, I think there's a we need to do some more fact finding. Um, so I would say that we hold off on this item um, and do the survey to get to get some more feedback um, and um, take a look at the survey now so that we can get all of the specific to make sure that the, the questions because we can't send out multiple surveys we won't get good responses eventually so i really want to get the survey right the first time so uh, i think we move on to that yes yes absolutely um chris you're talking you know you're unmute you're muted sorry about that just to to kind of you know Finish the point a little bit with regards to the and to the concern. Um, it, I think the comments that we had earlier about not really realizing how tall people are when we meet them in person after we we video conference with them for so long. You know what else don't we know about them, right? Through when we're when we're doing video supervision versus in person supervision. Uh, so I, I think that's where some of my hesitation comes in. But hearing all the publics concern about it. I understand the convenience part. I, I get all of that. But at the end of the day, the, you know, what we don't know, right? So I'll, I'll get I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you. So Sabina? Yeah, I was just going to chime in there and remind everybody we have another meeting coming up and we do have staff who need to take a lunch break or a biological break. And so we can adjust the beginning time for that other meeting. Um, but I just want to make sure we keep that in mind because we are going to have to skip some of our agenda items or table them for next time in order to make sure we still have time for our other meeting and to give our staff a little bit of a slight break at least. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sabina, for your for your suggestion. So Steve. May I make another suggestion? This might be crazy, but I know we don't like to schedule other meetings, but maybe because the survey is really becoming a central point and everything. Would would the committee be willing to schedule an additional meeting just to look at the survey questions in the near future? Just the thought, and then we can actually come back with more more ideas before that meeting. They they the staff could also um, take everything that they've heard today and see if and go back through yeah. the survey questions and just kind of see if they've covered everything maybe that they thought was already kind of discussed or were uh, brought out to be important you know, um, ideas or, and then maybe bring it back, like Steve said, for another shorter um, committee meeting. We, you know, today's meeting actually already provided a lot of extra information. And so, you know, so, and I, maybe the, the direction would be, yes, we schedule a meeting um, to just go through, you know, go over it. And it can be very short and sweet, but at the same time, you know, I think in the meantime, you know, I really encourage all the public, you know, re, you know, submit the, um, the, um, the information to Roseanne. And so that she can also, you know, whatever that hasn't been covered, you know, really send it to her so that we can incorporate it and then be able to move it forward. So, you know, so it looks like the soonest that we can do the meeting will be in two weeks, right? 
I mean, can we do that on the ninth? Um, um, yeah, I, we need I 10 like days to notice. notice. We need to notice it minimum of 10 days. Yeah, if we noticed it, if we noticed it. Yeah, we can we can uh, do that scheduling offline if that helps for um, instead of holding everybody up here. But yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we need ten, 10 days to publish it, but we need, you know, a couple days for the staff to get it together. So close to that. OK, so awesome. So we can, you know, definitely, you know, stay, you know, um, stay in tune, you know, for this particular one. And, um, you know, I would really like to see it, you know, happen as soon as possible. So anyway, okay, so I think we have a resolution. So, you know, and thank you all, you know, for your suggestion. You know, this is actually, you know, very important. You know, how do we move forward, you know, to in the long run? So um, the next agenda item is actually about the public comments for items not on the agenda. And uh, so I, you know, let's open it. Okay, so Roseanne. I, I have one um, that I will read into the record. Um, this is from Brooklyn Kendall, who is an, uh, an LMFT. Um, she's right. Dear board, I am writing to express my support for continuing telehealth options for our trainees and associates. I have been supervising both trainees and associates throughout the pandemic. It has enabled a greater flexibility with times to meet and a greater capacity for client care. Additionally, the continuation of care for clients moving through the state has been great. A great effect of more therapists providing telehealth. I see no reason not to allow this to continue since it has been accepted for over one year. I encourage you to take steps to make this a permanent change for our trainees and associates, enabling them to see clients via telehealth and to receive supervision has been a needed change in the way we train. And that is again from Brooklyn Kendall, LMS. Thank you. So we, let's uh, open to, to, to the public and um, for, you know, very, very co quick comment and please really state the stuff that you have not talked about and um, so that so that we can close the meeting as soon as possible. Um, moderator. This is the moderator. I pre opened the Q and a panel and the hand raise feature is activated as a reminder. This is for comments on items not on the agenda. If you are going to make a comment, you will be limited to 1 minute and we do ask that you keep your comments concise. If uh, you need more time, we request that you submit your comments in writing to the board. And our first comment comes from Fada Zarehi. Your line is open and you will have one minute. Hi there. Um, it's a comment and a question. I appreciate that y'all are willing to have discussions around this um, telehealth issue, but my question and my concern is Again, for those of us that are in the precarious position of not being able to meet with our supervisors in person and yet still having this kind of telehealth situation coming up, our waiver is expiring on Wednesday. So I'm curious what the board expects to do about that. Thank you. Steve, are you about to make? Yeah, so I mean, unfortunately, yes. there's unfortunately the waiver will, you know, may expire on on the 30th, but um, we are. I'm working with the department to try to get that extended at this point. I don't know if it's going to be extended and I and I know the, you know, the anxiety that brings on. I apologize for that. Uh, beyond the waiver, though, there's really nothing other than establishing um, statutory or regulatory type of uh, proposals. Um, we really can't do anything about um, the actual. You know, those the any the actual. Um, law that stands um, regardless of the waiver. So I, we recognize the concern and we are voicing that concern and working with the department. So unfortunately, that's really all I can say right now. So, apologize. And our next comment comes from Melissa Tian. I apologize if I've mispronounced your last name. Your line is open. You will have one minute. Melissa, can you hear us? All right, it looks like unfortunately Melissa's having technical issues with her audio and will not. Can be you hear me? Oh, yeah. we can't. Oh, good. Okay, I apologize for that. Uh -huh, I, I do. You actually 
pronounce my name wrong, right. So I wanted to say thank you for that because nobody ever does. <laughs> um, but I did just want to add this in really quickly. I was trying so hard to get out of a meeting and raise my hand during the public time or for comments on the supervision telehealth agenda item. It's something I wanted to throw out there as maybe an idea is if we did allow telehealth 100% in all settings, could we limit the number of associates or trainees in if they are accessing telehealth services for supervision? So maybe we make it where we do not allow triadic supervision if telehealth is the way that they are receiving supervision, we only allow one for one on one. Maybe we lower the groups. So instead of allowing eight, which are allowed for face to face supervision, we lower that down to four. So I just wanted to throw that out there as a possible suggestion or idea. Um, because I am in agreement that the 50 50 would put a real strain on supervisors and limit access to um, good supervisors and as everybody had states good client care in rural areas if that were the way that we would do things thank you very much and that concludes our public comment thank you very much so um the suggestion for future agenda items that's our next um agenda any suggestion for the board members chris We have plenty of things to talk about. <laughs> the next yes. meeting. I don't know that we need anything additional. Uh, we're, we're just at the tip of the iceberg of this uh, of this thing. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So, you know, looks like um, there is no more suggestion for future items and the, our favorite uh, items is a German. So the time now is 1254 PM and thank you all so much, you know, for the, uh, for the, a very vibrant discussion, very robust. And so, you know, and stay tuned and uh, we will certainly, you know, let you know when the next uh, telehealth committee meeting is going to be and have a very good uh, lunch and hope to see you all back to the our uh, licensing committee at one o'clock. Thank you. Bye.